Board of Trade. She breaks down why this is so important right now. There's a lot of small businesses that are stretched to the limit as it is with their staffing. So we certainly hope that this is going to be, um, will lessen the barriers to small businesses and allow them to participate. Ottawa Board of Trade President and CEO Su Ling Ching feels this program is another tool to support businesses and help ensure they stay open. Alex Gouge, City News. City News time 901. Now your forecast with City News meteorologist Jill Taylor. We'll have sun and cloud today. The high just 14 degrees below average tonight. Mainly clear down to four and for the weekend should have plenty of sunshine. Highs 19 Saturday about 18 Sunday. For today the high 14 and right now in ottawa and in smith falls it's four degrees today is a day health and education stakeholders have been asked to respond to a letter from the premier and there's he was seeking advice on the potential reopening of schools city news reporter kevin meisner now with what we can expect the government to or when we can expect them to make that decision premier doug ford has long said any decision he makes is based on the advice of chief medical officer dr david williams who has said he is in favor of reopening schools still the premier is seeking a second opinion here ford is asking health and education stakeholders in ontario to tell him where where they stand on the idea and he wants their responses by five this afternoon that of course setting up a possible decision and announcement on the situation with schools as early as Monday the province has always said that schools should be the first to reopen before any other restrictions are lifted I'm Kevin Meisner City News Time 902, a curfew that has been in place in Quebec since early January is being lifted this evening. Restaurant patios across the province will be permitted to reopen today, limit on gatherings being relaxed. The new measures come as COVID-19 hospitalizations in the province have declined to their lowest level in more than six months. Liberal MP William Amos says he is deeply embarrassed after being caught unaware on camera again. Amos is apologizing for urinating during a virtual session of the House of Commons, saying he didn't know he was visible to fellow parliamentarians. This was not a public feed. He adds that he is temporarily stepping away from his role as parliamentary secretary to the industry minister and also from his committee work so he can get some help. It was last month Amos went virtual after a screenshot was posted to social media. He appeared naked in an internal parliamentary feed. B.C. First Nations Health Authority says the discovery of the remains of 215 children on the site of a former residential school is extremely painful. The CEO of the agency, Richard Jock, suggests the situation has the potential to affect First Nations people in the province and, in fact, right across Canada. Chief Roseanne Casimir says the ground-penetrating radar specialist helped them confirm that grim discovery just last weekend. She says some of the children appear to be as young as three. It's believed the deaths are undocumented. I'm Andrew Boyle. For news anytime, follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. your opinion. It's the Rob Snow Show on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Uh, Friday. We made it. Could be a little warmer. But hey, it's the weekend, so why complain? Good morning. Welcome to the Rob Snow Show. All the great Friday fair is on the way. The legendary Lowell Green, best-selling author, Hall of Fame broadcaster, Captain of the Coupe de Carp, keeper of prized pigeons. He will be here in just a few minutes from now with his hot take on the big news stories of the day. Bork is back. PR Bork from Bork Newswatch will go over a week's worth of headlines. May have been a short week, but it was filled with headlines. Just one big news story after another. Steve Warren on sports from the uh, Sense Nation podcast and the Steve Warren Project. Habs win. Habs win. So hockey night in Canada. We'll be at the Bell Center in Montreal tomorrow night, Saturday night, Montreal. Doesn't it sound great? And 2,500 fans in the stands, 2,500 seats available. And we've been looking at some of the ticket reselling websites, the scalper websites, and uh, needless to say, <laughs> Habs, Leafs, Saturday night, Montreal, Hockey Night in Canada, hottest ticket in the country. 
David found tickets going on StubHub this morning. $3,800 each. $3,800 each. Little out of my price range. I will be content to watch it on television. But uh, that'll be nice to see, isn't it? That, that is nice to see. Fans in the stands at an NHL hockey game. First time in Montreal since um, March 10th of last year. March 10th of last year. Queen's Park and the business of the Ford government. Ford's handling of the pandemic. School reopenings. The economic reopening. The pace of the vaccination program. The wait time between doses of vaccine. We'll get into all of that with our MPP panel today. Every Friday we do Queen's Park Week in Review. And we should have a lot to review because Premier Doug Ford's going to crash the party today. He's going to crash our show. Now, we're not doing an interview. The Premier has a news conference scheduled for 1030 this morning. Now, it's scheduled to start at 1030 this morning. Eastern Daylight Time. But there's Eastern Daylight Time and then there is uh, there's Doug Ford time. Doug Ford's kind of... Uh, Working in his own time zone sometimes. But when it starts, you'll hear it on City News. What will he say about school reopenings? Parents want to know. Staff want to know. All kinds of people in pediatric medicine have been pleading with him. Please, Premier, reopen the schools. So what if there's only a month left in the school year? Open the schools. Get kids back in class. But the Premier... Well, he has been doing, how can I say this? He's been, he's been doing some serious fence sitting when it comes to making a decision. It is to the point, really, where it seems to me, honest to goodness, I think the Premier is suffering from uh, what we would call analysis paralysis. He says he is seeking consensus, which we would like our politicians to do, especially when it comes to dealing with other politicians. But... Pandemic politics, you would think political leaders would have learned by now, almost a year and a half into this pandemic, uh, you can't please everyone. And you can't please everyone all the time. You have to make a decision, and no matter what your decision, people are going to be mad at you. You just have to make the decision, and you have to live with the consequences. So... We'll all be listening. There could be news coming out of this news conference this morning on uh, schools. And another thing we'll be listening for is the wait time between doses of vaccine. To me, ladies and gentlemen, this is uh, now at this stage of the fight against COVID-19. and We are all weary of it. I'm right there with everyone. Getting second doses into people's arms. This is Canada's great shortcoming. The percentage of the population that can say it is fully vaccinated. I am fully vaccinated. I've had two doses of vaccine. It's Canada's great shortcoming. The fact is we continue to lag most of our peer countries and most notably, the United States and the United Kingdom, when it comes to the percentage of the population that is fully vaccinated. I will give the Trudeau government some credit. Not a lot of credit, but I'll give it some credit when it comes to ramping up the the campaign for first doses. We are now at the point where more than half of the population, uh, about 55% of the Canadian population, has had at least one dose of vaccine. Similar to levels seen in the United States and the United Kingdom. 54% in the UK, about 50% in the United States. But it, it, it is second doses where we trail and we trail badly. It's another story altogether. In the United Kingdom... 35% of the population of the United Kingdom is fully vaccinated. And in the United States, it's 40% of the American population is fully vaccinated. But in Canada, we haven't even hit 5% yet. As of this morning, I looked it up about a half an hour ago. 
It's 4.7% of the population is fully vaccinated. To me, we are a forgiving bunch. If we look at a number like that, 4.7% of the Canadian population, if we look at a number like that, we are a forgiving bunch if we call that a success. It's been five and a half months. Five months and 14 days, 165 days ago, it was the 14th of December. And that is when the vaccination program began in this country. You remember Trudeau at the Ottawa Hospital, big photo op. What if we started reporting in our news media? What if we started reporting it this way? Five and a half months into the vaccination program in Canada, 95% of the population remains Unvaccinated. (laughs) Maybe this is how the media should describe it. 95% of the population is yet to be fully vaccinated against COVID-19 in Canada. Five and a half months after the vaccination program first began. Doesn't that kind of put a different spin on things? I hope that's about to change. I really do. I don't want to wait one day longer than I have to for my second shot. Some provinces are cutting the wait between first and second doses. 16 weeks is being cut to 8 weeks in British Columbia. It's being cut from 16 weeks to 8 weeks in the province of Quebec for the AstraZeneca shot for now. And I also think it has to be clear to everyone by now that that decision to wait 4 months between doses was all about supply. It had nothing to do with science. It was kind of a wing and a prayer, if you ask me. It was all about the Trudeau government's failure to secure a reliable source of vaccines. And you can't pin the blame for that on any provincial premier. We know where the buck stops with that, at Rideau Cottage. It stops with the individual who is still widely expected to win a majority government, quite likely this fall. But given the news out of British Columbia, given the news out of Quebec, I am sure Premier Ford will be asked about the dosing interval today when he greets the Queen's Park press gallery. Don't they all get along? 1030 News Conference, we'll have it for you on City News. And during our talkback hour, hey, it's the Friday free-for-all, right? We love taking your calls during the Friday free-for-all during the talkback hour, 750-1310, 750-1310, 613 Why do we love the Friday free-for-all? Even though Doug Ford might crash our party today, we're going to take as many calls as we can because during the Friday free-for-all, you pick the topics. We don't pick the topics. It's old-school, open-line talk radio. You come up with the topics. Within reason, we just kind of roll with it. And it's always kind of wild and crazy. It's an adventure because you just never know where the conversation will go. So let's get it going on the Rob Snow Show on City News. The Rob Snow Show brought to you by my business, in a, especially in a pandemic, in that kind of situation, is very challenging. First, uh, people don't know me. People don't know my product to build a new clientele, to build a trust for them to to show them that I care about it. I do love my food. Uh, That was the biggest challenge. And of course, in all lockdown, um, what I had to face it regards my employee, guests, ladies, what they work for me. I didn't want to tell them, sorry, I'm close. I'm not having a job for you. No, they have a family. They have kids to feed. So this is very important because we are family orientated. And uh, we decided to open. We, of course, essential business. So uh, been very tough, very, very tough as we didn't see people on the road. Market was completely quiet, but we knew that we have to wait and we knew it that we're going to be fine. In this town, we built an um, online shop, uh, Vedel Online. And uh, we did Uber, Uber Eats, which one is picking up and is very, um, very popular. We have a really good uh, feedback. So this is the um, uh, song for my heart. And uh, yeah, and we try to uh, expand. I thinking about opening another location. So uh, I want to make Vedel 
famous. I want to make the Vedel place to be for all the families with kids, try the traditional food, what their grandparents cooked in the countries when they're from, or even Canadian people. I'm, they're more than welcome to come and try our famous pierogies. I try to be passionate about my food, uh, organic food, food made with love, with all homemade, uh, organic. So. Uh, you can find uh, food from all over the Europe, Polish, German, Ukrainian, Romanian, um, French, uh, Armenian, so all kind of different uh, types of food. Uh, homemade lunches, we focus on the homemade lunches, grandma style. Uh, I keep always saying, like in my Genya Babcha house, how she cooked, I wanted this love and this food over here because I believe that would bring all uh, all people around me and uh, yeah all the um, organic cold cuts uh, lovely selection of, uh, of uh, sausages uh, cheeses European cheeses uh, great selections of mustard uh, French uh, cookies all where you need from Europe you can find here at the Vedel Touch of Europe if you think good way that's it you have to I had the option to cry in the corner and say, oh, pandemic is coming. No, you need to stand up and fight for it and be, have your eyes open, think outside of the box and, and, and do it. He's the opinionated Ottawa icon. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. Good morning, Lowell Green. Good morning, Rob. Um, you know, for many years I have been trying to get someone to give me David Suzuki's phone number. Um, <laughs> I, I want to know when global warming is going to start. I, I've got the guys coming today at great expense to open my swimming pool. And what is it now, about four <laughs> degrees outside? Have to, I, they're going to have to <laughs> shovel it off first. Maybe. <laughs> Even the pigeons won't come out. I mean, the coop de carp, I've opened up the door this morning, and the, the, one of the pigeons sort of stuck its head out and looked at it. Oh, that was, it went That's back it. in again. That's I, it. I, I huddled down in the straw. Oh, my goodness. Not, I'm, I'm going to tell you, I know that uh, the weather is not one of your topics it's today. Okay. But not only is it bitterly cold, and I mean bitterly cold for this time of year, but, man, we need rain. Yes. Uh, things are really, really dry. Uh, we took a little drive out to Pakenham yesterday, and there were two or three farmers out working their fields. And, I mean, they were just the dust was just like almost a mile high in one instance. It was uh, quite astonishing to see things so dry. Um, on this business of vaccines, yes. I'm not quite sure if people understand what has to be done as yet as you very accurately pointed out it's taken us almost five and a half months to get about 55 percent of our people vaccinated <clears throat> excuse me with one dose but only 4.7 percent have the second dose this means that essentially we have to start all over again everything that we have gone through in five and a half months to get one shot we have to do again to get the second shot, just in order to get 55% of our population fully vaccinated. I, I, I don't think people really realize. They say, oh, well, we can get the second shot. Yeah, but wait a minute. It's taken us five and a half months to get one shot. Now we got to get it. We have to do it exactly the same thing. Another shot has to be given. Okay. Yeah. Is it going to take us five and a half months to do this? I don't know. But I agree with you. I hope that they can shorten the, the time down. I had my first shot on March 24th, and the second shot is not due until uh, July 14th. So I, could, I hope that it's sooner than that. But whatever it is, we got to go through this whole process all over again for the second shot. And you're quite right. The reason that, uh, that they had the, the four-month delay was simply so that, that Trudeau could say, look, I've got 55% of the population vaccinated. No, you don't. In fact, 55% of the population is about is just half vaccinated, for God's sake. Half the population is half vaccinated. And so, in other words, we have we have fully vaccinated, or about 25, you know, if you take everything into account, about 25%. Um, I, I didn't say that right. <laughs> but but I, I, you understand my point, is that 
this is not a simple matter to give everybody a second shot. It wasn't a simple matter to give us the first shot. And we've got to do exactly the same thing all over again. Not, not only that, but all the extra expense and everything else, at, at any rate. On another issue, I understand that you've had some pretty hot uh, phone calls concerning th- about three, two point nine million dollars for a Porsche do- a dealership in Vanier. Yeah, Mark, Am I right? Mark Motors. Little, yeah, little upset about that. Mark Motors. Yeah, li- yeah, yeah. A tax credit. Yeah, tax credit. Yeah. Let me just say this. Okay. All right. That there are few people in this city who have been more involved in, in more businesses than I. Most successful, some not always successful, but in all of those businesses, pet business, ice cream business, travel business, uh, newspaper. newspaper business, I could go on and on and on. Mm-hmm. I have never once, ever, ever gotten any help of any kind from any level of government, nor should I have tried, or should I have ever received it. I did try, to be honest with you. Um, this, I just don't understand how governments at any level can pick and choose who's going to get a tax break. I remember very distinctly sitting in at a very raucous meeting of Canada City Council when the Ottawa senators were trying to get a little bit of a tax break. Oh, yeah. Not, yeah. not, not They weren't asking that they not have any tax. They would still pay a huge tax sum, but a little bit of a tax break. And try as they might, they couldn't get... The, finally, one councillor, I guess, gave them a little bit of a break of some kind. So when we today have the senators. But I remember, I mean, I, I remember the federal government was going to give the senators some sort of a tax break, I think, to, as I recall. Well, Rob Bryden was lobbying uh, the right. Liberal government at the time. And, and, uh, and, and John, John rate, Manley he, was the Minister of Finance at the time. I remember that. And, that's uh, right. And, yeah. and the, the government first announced, oh, well, we'll, we'll give them a little <laughs> bit of a tax break. And then the media, particularly the sports media in Toronto, God bless them, yeah. raised such hell that the very next day the government said, no, we can't give them this break. So We can't uh, give, yeah, can't give uh, millionaire no. hockey players a tax break, right? Yeah, so, well, the, the Ottawa senators, yeah. yeah, yeah but yeah. then not only not only the senators were, you know, asked for a bit of a tax break, yeah. with the same argument that they're using by Mark Motors, oh, well, it'll generate all sorts of more revenue. But I can also, I mean, ask ask all of the merchants up and down, let's say, Rideau Street. How long has Rideau Street been ripped up? Like, what, about 400 well, years? Well, it's pretty much finished now, but, yeah. Yeah, but, I mean, it's been, it's been years. Oh, yeah, and Elgin Street was closed, and Main Street was closed. Right, did and, any of those yeah. guys get a tax break? I don't think so. Right. I think they asked for some sort of a tax break. I don't think they ever got it. Mm. I, I just don't understand. I don't understand how governments can... Well, the city, you know, let me explain. I mean, the city, you know, and I'm with you for the most part. Do we need all of these incentive programs, brownfield programs and whatever, to to spur development, especially in Ottawa, where, I mean, gosh, a a vacant parcel of land is vacant for about two days before they're slapping a condo tower up on it, for crying out loud, right? Um, But they, uh, they have identified these communities where they want to uh, spur economic development. One of them was Bell's Corners, where they built, uh, and this program, community improvement program, um, is credited in part with uh, luring a Holiday Inn, for example, to Bell's Corners, a new Holiday Inn. Now, Holiday Inn is one of the largest hotel chains in the world. Uh, Did it really need a few million dollars from the city of Ottawa to build that? It probably helped, but, um, and Vanier is another one. But, yeah, we also have to ask, you know, what do we want what, what 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 do we want Montreal Road to look like? Um, but you know, Rob, you know, Montreal Road is ten or fifteen minutes away from Parliament Hill. It, it, you know, it should be thriving. It should be gentrified. Uh, or do we want Montreal Road to just eternally be uh, the home of the payday loan lender and the pawn shop forever and a day? First of all. I don't believe that any of this stuff really works anyway. The market will decide where development should go. Private enterprise will decide. Every time the government gets involved, not only does the cost soar probably three or four times what it would cost with private industry, but they can't make proper decisions. This should be left. I, I am a capitalist. This should be left up to private enterprise. The market will decide. If you want to you know, talk 
to me about government decisions. Let's look at LeBreton Flats. I came to Ottawa in 1960. Sure. When they, there was the last that time that they bulldozed the last of LeBreton Flats. That, how many years is that? You, you, you add up at 19, and they still can't decide what the hell to do with LeBreton Flats. And the one decision that they did, well, the, the War Museum is, is well done. But how about, well, you and I have talked about that condo. This is a I government know. decision to allow that condo. It's got to be the ugliest damn condo on the face of the planet, for God's sake. <laughs> and this was a government decision to build it. Yeah. Let private enterprise do this. The, the market will decide. If the market decides that it wants to upgrade Vanier, it will do so. If the market decides it doesn't want to do that, there's no demand there, then then it will not happen. Let the people decide. If you want if you want a, a Porsche dealership on Montreal Road, well, let Mark Boaters or whoever it is build it, but there's no damn way taxpayers' money should go into it. Okay. It's, there's just no all way. Right. So you're with all the lefties at City Hall. I'm, I'm surprised well, to hear it, that. Uh, that in, in this case, uh, left, right, whatever it is, yeah. let the market decide okay. government you know what rob the government should i have to get you one of councillor menard's um buttons that says uh people over <laughs> porsches i'll have to get you one of those <laughs> people uh, maybe a uh, pigeons no, the, over porsches for Lowell once, green once in a while know. even the leftists can get it right the right. fact is okay. i don't want <laughs> government involved in that no. get, get okay. the hell government we can't afford i mean every time the government decides to do this my taxes go up and the services go down instead of giving 2.9 million dollars to mark motors how about picking up my garbage every damn sure. week you know during the summertime so that i can avoid maggots and my wife yelling at me okay <laughs> the, the, the what are you putting be, <laughs> what are you putting in there basic. holy cow Fix the roads. You know what? How the hell are they? How the hell are they going to, you know, help a, a build a new car dealership? And they can't even fix the roads. Fix the damn roads. Yeah. I, we were driving. Well, I don't even know if I want to drive a Porsche on these roads. I Precisely. Mean, fix the roads. <laughs> fix the potholes. You know, pick up the garbage. Okay. You start incinerate. Whatever the hell it is. These are the government services. But stay out of my life. Let the market decide. And as I say, every time the government gets involved, it's usually the wrong decision. Uh, it's usually costing us three or four times. I did a survey one time about low-cost housing when private enterprise bills it. I forget what it is, but when when government bills low-cost housing, the cost is increased by about 200%. They, everybody knows that as soon as the government gets involved, all of the contractors, the bills well, yeah. and everything well, else, yeah, they yeah. just screw yeah, the government. Yeah, this was one of my commentaries this week, one of my Snow and 60 commentaries this week, was that they announced this these transit projects in Toronto. Yeah. Uh, $28 billion. Now, I well, thought... Uh, Twenty-eight billion dollars. Okay, twenty-eight. What do you suppose that is going to cost by the time that is all finished? Now, twenty-eight God knows billion three or four dollars. Times that. But as a one example, yeah. how much did it? How much did they charge us for those skating shacks along the canal? Two hundred and seventy grand or something like per, that per, per unit. Per unit, yeah. <laughs> and you want the government right. involved in doing this kind They're of They're really stuff? nice, though. They've held up well since then. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. For that price, they should. Look, we got to run. Bork is standing by, okay? Uh, I stay don't warm. Run do, you, do you have the heat on? Uh, yes, we Yeah, you got the, the wood stove on. roaring out there. <laughs> I'm going to go out and console <laughs> okay. my pigeons. They have right. no idea what's going on. But if anybody knows David Suzuki's phone number, let me know. Yeah, I okay. want to know when global warming starts. Good Thank stuff. you. Bye-bye. All right, Lowell Green, Pierre Bork of Bork News Watch, right after the news on City News.
one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Friday, May 28th. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa and in Smith Falls, it's five degrees. And here's what's making news this hour. The Premier is scheduled to hold a media briefing about one hour from now at 1030 to outline the next step in the vaccination rollout of Ontario. Whether he mentions schools remains to be seen. Doug Ford has asked stakeholders to get back to him by five o'clock this afternoon with their thoughts on reopening to in-class learning so he can make a decision that is expected early next week. The school year, some want it brought back uh, in-class learning before the end of the school year, which is now less than one month away. Quebec's curfew in place since January 9th lifted this evening as the province begins relaxing measures aimed at slowing the spread of COVID-19 in that province. Restaurant patios will be permitted to reopen today. The new measure comes as COVID-19 hospitalization in Quebec have declined to the lowest level they've been for the past six months. A small fire at the Walmart in Carleton Place did force it to close around the noon hour yesterday. The store is scheduled to reopen according to the company website site at noon today. Ocean Way Fire Company called to a small electrical fire around 11.30 there yesterday morning. The online Great Glebe Garage Sale will begin today. This is for anyone wanting to sell something. You can start your online store. Bidding will start next Friday for your goods on June 4th. City News Time at 9.33. I'm Andrew Boyle. For news anytime, follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Strong voice. Strong opinions. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 101.1 FM and 1310 AM. Bork is back. Pierre Bork. Welcome back from Bork News Watch. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Just spoke to a, an old voice, f- quite familiar with Dave Tripp in your production. Uh, isn't that great? Yeah. Terrific. Yeah. Free agent yeah. signing for us. We love it. We yeah, love it. It's a get. Yeah, it's, it's, a, get. it's a huge score for us. Yeah, we're really happy to have Dave as part of the team here. Yeah, it's great stuff. Great stuff. Um, you got a log on the fire out there or what? It's a little bit of a bite in the air this morning, eh? We've got the fire pit going, but I'll tell you, I woke up this morning with the windows open. Oh, last night, chilly, 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 bo Billy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um, it's been a sort of a, a wild and crazy month of May for weather. We got the the tease with the mini heat wave there, and uh, next thing you know, it's kind of frosty. I don't know what to do. Um, I f- I'm not a gardener, but I feel for the gardeners right now. Uh, th- those with the green thumbs must be frustrating for them. The, they don't yeah, know what I would. To do. I would imagine. I'm. I'm not much of a gardener myself, but when you hear the uh, the frost warnings uh, for the region, you're probably looking at everything you've done during that heat wave and thinking, "Oh, oh, what now?" Right. Look, I don't want to belabor this um, Will Amos story, but isn't that a that is a wild and crazy one, isn't it? Willie from the Pontiac, Willie's Willie. Uh, it's crazy. Yeah, he's a local MP. Look, he's just on the other side of the river. That's from right. Us, yep. And. Uh, yep. He, you'd figure he would have known better. Look, accidents happen during the Zuma era. Yes. And we've seen many, many, many <laughs> funny clips uh, on YouTube, lots of them. Uh, but this guy certainly got caught with his pants down on that one. And uh, he's, he's come back for a, for a sequel or an encore, if you will. And uh, he's decided, okay, maybe I need a little professional help. Yeah, and but he I mean, uh, okay, so it says he's the parliamentary secretary to, uh, who is it? Industry or whatever it is, anyway. Fizzy parliamentary Phil. secretary. Fizzy, Phil, Fizzy right. Phil Champagne, the former Foreign <laughs> Affairs right. Minister. Yeah, yeah. So um, he, he says he's going to step away from his role as a parliamentary secretary to seek help. But who do you call <laughs> for, for help with something like that? Um, who do you call? Um, you know, Geek Squad or something? I don't know. Who do you call? Uh, I, I, I think I think a guy like that calls the employment office and says, "I wonder what I could be doing here post election because uh, I'm going to guess that people could find a better representative than me, and uh, I'm going to go off into the sunset and do something else." Oh, really? Okay. That's what I think. Oh, really? Okay. Gosh. Well, well I mean, there's what, a story you, today. You there's a story today. I mean, if you're elected in 2015, you really want to win in. 
2021 if the election is this fall because you have to serve six years to qualify for your pension. So you have to make it to the fall to qualify for your pension. Right. You have to make so, it to the to the to the fall. Uh, Octo- you'd couple- have to make it to October or something, I guess, or October, yeah. or December or something. Yeah. Right. So yeah. it's a it's a tough thing maybe for that kind of a guy. But if you're one of his constituents, you're wondering you're thinking twice. You're thinking twice. If you live uh, yeah. in one of those wonderful lakes up in the Pontiac, you're yeah. thinking, all right, this is my MP, but do I want him at my local barbecue? I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and if he shows up at the barbecue, what's he going to be wearing? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We don't need any skinny-dipping MPs. No, no. It's such a... You know, I'd, again, I don't want to make too much of it, but I, I'm sure he's mortified, but I can't even... Uh, you know, once... Okay, once is a thing. Uh, to go viral for that reason once, but then I woke up this morning. I was like, "You have got to be kidding me, Willie! What are you doing, yep. guy? Come on!" Yep. What is the going? And the thing Willie. is, you know, he's a nice guy. I interviewed him several times during um, the flooding. The uh, last year we had the terrible flooding. When was it? Twenty nineteen, I guess. Right? We had the last round of terrible flooding along the Ottawa River because uh, the. You know, his riding of the Pontiac, and there was bad flooding up uh, near Manawaki in that area. He has a huge riding. The Pontiac is a massive riding, right? Um, you know, very, very constituent-minded um, MP, speaks French and English fluently. Everything you would expect somebody, someone from the Pontiac to be, you know? Young guy. Um, it's, it's sad to see it. I, I go that way this. for him, you know. So. I, I will say this, Rob. Ben. Yeah, you know, yeah. we're we're not uh, we're not responsible for his actions or no. inactions. No. But uh, politicians float on image. Yeah. And that's it. You know, Doug Ford during the early days of the pandemic was suddenly seen as the guy who was doing right. And uh, prior to the pandemic, he was having trouble getting traction. And then suddenly he was the man for his times. And more recently, that was, that's become questionable. Same with uh, Justin Trudeau in the minds of many people. Uh, clearly uh, very popular with many elements of society if he's had uh, successes that he's had at the polls. But people are questioning in some areas and some people are not. So in some elements, you have an image that's positive and some you have one that's negative. In this guy's case... Uh, right now it's negative. I'm not sure how you counterbalance that with something positive. That's the difficulty right there. And if you're the Liberal Party of Canada and you're seeking out your uh, your circumstances to move from a minority government to a major, majority government for this next election that may come in six months, when it, whenever that comes, you're going to be thinking, we've got to have our best people that we put forward. And maybe we can find something for we willy to do in uh, in other areas of government that don't uh, require an elected uh, mandate. Or Zoom. <laughs> or Zoom. <laughs> you know, God forbid that that guy ever has to show up in front of a Zoom camera again. What do you think the big story of the week has been? Well, I'm... Uh, I'm tempted to say vaccines again. I know that sounds boring. No, I th- I agree with you totally. Yeah. Are are we not all wondering what the heck is going on? Look, myself, I got my first shot on March 19th, and so apparently March 19th. I'm eligible. Wow, you were early. For second okay. AstraZeneca shot. Yeah. Uh, but it's a goat dance to try and find one. Number one. Right. And number number two, all of them expire on Monday. Yeah. In three days. Yeah. So chances are slim to none. So where does that leave me? Yeah, whatever's left expires on Monday. It's like 45,000 doses, I think, right? Yeah, they yeah. Said, yeah and yeah, they're probably yeah. going to throw have to throw them out by the thousands because they couldn't get their act together to get them out to the people that have been wanting them. Yeah, and you, you told me uh, last week, because you qualified to, you know, call your pharmacy and try to get in and get one of these soon to expire AstraZeneca second doses, right? You were yep. that was right you were right in that wheelhouse, right? Yep. Yep. Right in that cohort. And uh, did you ever hear back from the pharmacist or did they call you back and say we don't have any or how did it play out for you? Uh, so I, I I did speak to a pharmacist. Yes. In fact, I've spoken to several pharmacists as most people who are in my shoes have done this past week. Yeah. Uh, you know, like I said, it is a goat dance. The pharmacist, I, you know, first of all, God love them. If they're listening to us right now, thank you very much for the service you're doing. 
because you also are on the front lines. And can you imagine the hundreds of calls, the countless hours of oh, wasted, yeah. you know, private sector time answering questions, uh, and you don't have the. And the worst part is they don't know what they're going to have tomorrow. They don't know what they're going to have today until the shipment arrives. Oh, we got it. Oh, we don't. And so the, everybody is left at their own devices, thanks to whoever decided how they were going to roll this out. And, you know, what was the other news that came out earlier this week, Rob, with respect to uh, with respect to um, um, the, the vaccines was that younger people, people in their teens would now also be eligible. Yeah. So I've got a 16 year old. Okay. And so we've been chasing that down. That, too, is a goat dance. Oh, yeah. You know, like, I mean, yeah. for gosh sakes, forget about Coop de Carp and his pigeons. You know, I mean, you can start yourself Nanny Goat Hill here. You've got enough coats to move around. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, it'll be interesting uh, to hear from Doug Ford today. Now, he has this news conference scheduled to start at 1030. Hopefully it starts on time and we'll, we'll have it for you during our program. Um, we see in Quebec, they're cutting the wait time in half for AstraZeneca from 16 weeks down to eight weeks. British Columbia from 16 weeks down to, to eight weeks. Um, so that's good news. What, what do you think about that? That's good news, well, right? It, uh, it, you know, it'd be nice if Ontario could do the same thing, obviously. Yeah, but it also puts into question whatever logic uh, the, the genius has floated to the public to warrant that we could have 16 weeks in the first place. Yeah. You know, I mean, it puts it's, puts all of their credibility to question. And I've, I've been suggesting that for a while here. I mean, there are ulterior motives for whatever they float on any given day. Yesterday, I watched the National... Uh, press conference, you know, Dr. New, uh, I don't know what happened to Dr. Tam. She seems to be removed from uh, from TV cameras. They've got some new ladies, quite toothy, uh, but she doesn't answer any questions. And I've watched the parliamentary press gallery go through their, their questions. And even John Iveson, I guess, back from his, uh, his uh, parcel deliveries, you know, uh, they're, you know, the way Post Media is doing parcel deliveries with their, their journalists. But, I mean, the questions are not being answered. And why not? Like, why can't you just get straight, simple answers? I think it's because they don't have straight, simple answers to give. Okay. So they got to come up with something more convoluted. Okay. I, I want to ask you about uh, the Indianapolis 500. You, uh, for people who, who aren't aware, Pierre used to be a race car driver and is a big fan of motorsports, obviously, right? So the um, Indianapolis 500 is when? Sunday? Sunday afternoon. Sunday. Yes, You'll be watching. It's uh, it is a spectacle. Uh, yeah. that's one of my favorite races. Have you have you that. been there? I, I've been, and I've gone around the track on a bus. On a bus, okay. <laughs> 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 Not quite the same experience, I guess. Right, but yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. What's it like? Uh, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, according to Wikipedia, is the largest sports venue in the world. Yeah, well, they have they'll they'll get a quarter. They won't this year, I guess, but they on a normal year they'll get a quarter million people on one on one place. Wow! Um, so, and that's uh, that's followed by tracks like Talladega and Daytona. And I've raced at those other two, uh, but in the case of Indianapolis, it is quite a spectacle. And the fact that they're open wheel cars makes it particularly um, salient and unnerving to me as a racing driver. And uh, my family will tell you I'm the worst backseat driver in the world. So watching other people doing that at that racetrack. It's a compelling thing to watch, but to me, they're always within, uh, you know, a blink of an eye of total chaos and disaster. So that makes it quite compelling. Okay. So um, I don't know much about the IndyCar series. Uh, who would be, say, the favorite to win that race then, do you think? Yeah, uh, yeah you know, I think that's, uh, that's one of those races, Rob, where because the track itself is, uh, you know, there's just four corners and you're, you're reliant on the quality of your, of your equipment and your uh, team that in the pits because you're going to lose a lot of time when you come in to change your tires and what have you. But uh, that is one of those races that historically has proven to be a real toss-up when it comes to favorites actually winning. But I'll point to a Canadian. There is a Canadian in the race, James okay. Hinchcliffe. Uh, I know him, and I know his father. He sat on the board of the Canadian Motorsport Hall of Fame with me. And James, is he is a hard-charging racer. He's had the pole in the past, wow. the Indy 500, meaning you start at the front. Yep. And he'll be in the hunt, and uh, that's the guy who I'm going to be hoping for. All right. 
Is there like a traditional meal that goes along with the Indianapolis 500 at the Bork household? Or, uh, just... uh, well, you know, for the Super Bowl, the Grey Cup, it's chili. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suggest it may be uh, barbecued hot dogs for this barbecued one. Barbecued hot dogs. Yummy, yes, yummy, yummy. All right. Look, stay warm, my friend. Stay warm. All right. And uh, we'll talk to you next week. Always a great pleasure to have you on the show. Have a good weekend. Yep, you too. Pierre Bork from Bork Newswatch. So when could government workers here in Ottawa go back to an office setting, back to work in the office? Uh, We'll take into that issue a little bit more this morning. Chris Elward is going to join us from the Public Service Alliance of Canada. This is the Rob Snow Show on City News. I wanted to give gifts to my volunteers, so I started making, I knew this is a skill I had, so I made a chocolate that had, that had culture, a cultural based uh, with a teaching, because culture here is not just a little part, it's uh, the large part, it's the fundamental part of our, um, our organization. So then we started doing, you know, just little programs and we sell a few at a fair, and then we started getting contracts. People were starting to enjoy the the the, the, the chocolates and started g- getting more and more contracts all across Canada. And then we decided to become a social enterprise, and we were able to create two jobs. And Val is one of our um, uh, uh, chocolatiers, very talented. Uh, we were able to help her with uh, employment. We started just with a little bit in the kitchen, doing a little bit of chocolate together, and next thing, it's just kind of taken off. And it's, it's great, because I love doing, to be creative, and we get to create a lot, and make up stuff, and it's just a, I just love it. It's just great that we get to make money back for Wabano, and it's helping me out, and we're helping just everybody out, Wabano and everything. <laughs> we met, uh, a, a very uh, socially conscious uh, business owner uh, being around town and we decided to, to uh, partner because beans and chocolate, uh, I mean coffee and chocolate uh, are sort of created the same way uh, and there's, uh, you know, and they're very, you know, uh, one, uh, one uh, origin uh, bean, you know, so uh, it was a good pairing together. And, uh, and it's, it's been a fantastic partnership for both of us. I was fortunate enough to get introduced to Purat, the head of Wabano Fine Chocolates, uh, through a local uh, networking group. And I was completely intrigued by the social enterprise that she was running. And, and then I looked at what we were doing, trying to support local business and supporting um, local communities, and it, just, it was a perfect match, and it's been fantastic ever since. We make every batch by hand. We temper it by hand to get to the consistency it needs to be to make a good chocolate. And one of the best, also wonderful things we did, we have connected with Ed, with being around town, and our coffee bars have been an amazing hit. So we're really excited about the connection with our, with our coffee. is changing so keep up with rob the rob snow show returns on rogers tv and city news 1011 fm and 1310 a.m given where we are with the pandemic and the vaccination program what does that mean for our public servants here in the national capital region most of them are working at home when could they return to the workplace for some insight into that it's a great pleasure to welcome back to the rob snow show on city news chris elward the national president of the public service alliance of canada good morning morning rob yeah it's very nice to hear from you when will public servants return to the workplace instead of working from home? Well, the simple answer to that is when it's safe to do so. Um, right now, we know that we, we, we represent about 160,000 federal public sector workers, uh, certainly a good chunk of them right here in the national capital region, as you pointed out. 
And we know that three out of four of our members are working uh, from home. Um, the tre- Treasury Board, the uh, Minister, uh, the President of the Treasury Board, Johnny Deco, uh has indicated that, you know, working from home, uh, working remotely is going to be the way of the future uh for many federal public sector workers uh i think what federal public sector workers have done uh, you know during the all during the pandemic uh you know government kept uh, running uh kept functioning uh, public sector workers got those uh, you know supports out the door when canadians needed it the most so i think it's uh there's a couple of things there first of all obviously public services are essential um uh, and even though you know, the vast majority are working from home. Uh, it still can be done uh, effectively. Uh, but there are sort of, I guess, strings attached to that because when you have members working from home, you know, what about their health and safety? Uh, what about the, you know, the, 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 the daily contacts and that sort of thing? So we do have some concerns uh, in that respect. Uh, but really, we, we are in constant con- uh, communications with Treasury Board on a, basically a bi-monthly basis uh, yeah. on the pandemic and that. Yes. And right now, a return to work. And what do you talk about when you, when you talk to uh, Mr. Duclo, for example, at Treasury Board? What are big issues that you're pressing upon him right now, Mr. Elward? Basically, the, the, the issues are, you know, uh, the, the, the effects that our members are facing from working from home. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's isolation and, and that sort of thing. Uh, so that's the, that, and, and, you know, the health and safety. When you go into your office, just like when you go into your workplace, you have the right to be, you know, in a workplace that's uh, certainly healthy and, and safe. Uh, so we are concerned about that. But as far as a reopening of uh, the federal government, is, you know, going back to work and having uh, workers return to the workplace, it's, right now it's really not even on the radar. Not even uh, on the radar. No, no. I mean, it's, uh, it's you know, we're looking at possibly, uh, you know, fall uh, for any kind of uh, return to work. Uh, but as I said, I mean, you know, I, I know that our members are working uh, from home and, and, you know, doing a very effective job. Uh, there's nobody that can, uh, can point to any part of the government uh, operations to say, well, this hasn't been done or, or that ha- uh, hasn't been done. No. Uh, and and I'll go I'll go back to last April when uh, the Liberal government announced the uh, the Canada Emergency Relief Benefit. When they announced it, the timeline to get it out through the door, I I was one of the ones who said this is crazy. There's no way. <laughs> I was wrong. No, you did. And, you did. You know, and it was well done, sir. It was well done. But I I guess the question is. Um, what if people want to go back to work, Mr. Elbert? I mean, what if they you know they're. They're they're climbing the walls. They feel like yeah, no, uh, you know. What if they absolutely right? because yeah. no, you're right, uh, Rob. Absolutely, uh, you know, when, when you're working from home, you're, you're you're juggling three or four things at the same time. As I'm sure most of your listeners will understand, you're you know you're at home. You're trying to do your 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 work. You're trying to probably cheer uh, care for small children who you know because of school closures or childcare closures. So you're you know you're juggling two or three things, and then it's the whole social aspect as well. You know, it's uh, you, you can't walk down the hall and talk to one of your coworkers or bounce something off one of your coworkers. So it, it's not real healthy. Uh, but as it is right now, we, we don't believe. I mean, you know, do we want tens of thousands of people on public transportation uh, every day going back and forth uh, to work when it can be done from home? So all of those things have to be taken into consideration. And as you said, I mean, you know, there is some light at the end of this tunnel with the, the vaccinations uh, uh, certainly uh, uh, increasing now and basically on a weekly basis. So I, I would think it's going to be, you know, late fall before we see any kind of, uh, you know, the downtown Ottawa uh, being full of federal public sector workers uh, again. And, you know, it's, it's, we don't like it, as I said, but, you know, we're, we're going into another round of bargaining with this government. Right. And how does, how does work from home change the collective bargaining process? What, what, exactly. what, is, what issues then become, say, more prominent than they were before? That's right. I mean, and, you know, there is a telework uh, policy uh, that the government has in place, and we'll be looking to, uh, to expand that. Uh, to make sure that, you know, our members uh, have the right to sort of step away uh, from their computers, uh, you know, probably more often than what they do now. Right now, they're entitled to a 15-minute break every four hours. So we'd be looking at probably expanding that. 
you know, with the Zoom fatigue and stuff like that to be taken into consideration. Uh, and like I say, I mean, you know, you, you, you're sitting at your desk, you're, you're, you're doing things, you get a little bit frustrated, you get up and, you know, you go right. out for a walk for five yeah. minutes and you come back. That's a little bit more difficult. Well, difficult plus, you know, I just think about uh, Mr. Elwer, and I'm sorry to, 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 to interrupt, uh, if the employee is working at home and not in the workplace, uh, it's the employee is using their utilities, their, 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 you know, it's their heat that's on, it's their lights that, that's on, it's their data that's being used on their internet, right? Um, Absolutely. It, you know, it would seem to change the, you know, the nature of the employee-employer dynamic to me. No, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There, there, there's a, there's a, you know, several things that uh, we would have to look at and consider, uh, and and we'll be doing that uh, going uh, into this round of bargaining. We start negotiations again next month uh, for what are four main uh, treasury board units that represents about 120,000 of our members, okay. uh, and and we'll be looking certainly at uh, you know uh, remote work as as one of the priorities uh, for sure. Among your members at Public Service Alliance of Canada, who is going to the office right now? Well, well, uh, well I mean, certainly those, you know, who are, who are critical. Obviously, our, we have our, all our food inspectors, uh, you know, on, on site. We have our border service officers on site. Uh, we have some uh, members, certainly, with uh, that support in, uh, military, with the Department of National Defense, have to be on site. Uh, and then there's other offices that, you know, uh, have to remain open as well, such as, you know, Service Canada, there's a skeleton crew at Service Canada, that sort of thing. Uh, so outside of, you know, and then we have, of course, the, the federal institutions as well. Uh, you know, our members who work in those federal institutions, they have to be uh, at the work site. Uh, okay. So, you know, and a number, but, you know, we know of the 160,000 members that we represent, as I said, three out of four are working for, from home. Okay. Uh, and again, this is kind of an Ottawa-centric question, but, you know, we're, we've, we're the capital, so we're we're you know, government is our business here. How many do you have any idea? Say what percentage of your members say have relocated out of the national capital region because they don't have to be in Ottawa or be in Gatineau or Eastern Ontario or West Quebec to to even do their job. Yeah, no, I, I I don't have that number as far as you know how many of our members may have relocated, but I think the the, the housing market. Uh, is dictating that uh, when you look at the housing market on the you know the outskirts uh, yeah. of Ottawa are, are certainly on the uptake and and I think that's partly the reason for it. People realize, okay, I don't have to be you know I don't have to live downtown anymore. I don't have to be close to downtown anymore. I, I can you know move sixty, seventy, a hundred kilometers outside of uh, Ottawa in this current context. So. All right, Mr. Howard. Interesting time, sir. Stay well. Thank you again. To you and Thank your you members and all the work they're doing right now. Stressful times for a lot of people still. Uh, Chris Alward, National President, Public Service Alliance of Canada. We're back after the 10 o'clock news. Hey, it's the Friday free-for-all. Something on your mind, something in the news. Hey, even if it's not in the news, maybe you think it should be in the news. Let's talk about it. That's what the Friday free-for-all is all about. 750-1310, grab a line before Doug Ford crashes our party. This is City News.
This is City News. CIWW 1310 AM in Ottawa. And CJET 1011 FM in Smith Falls and the Valley. Number one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News. Now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Friday, May 28th. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa and in Smith Falls, 5 degrees. Here's what's making news in Ottawa and the Valley. Ottawa Board of Trade is handing out the free rapid COVID-19 test to small businesses with 150 employees or less. That group charged with doling out the provincially supplied kits. Every single one of them available right now spoken for before the actual handout, which begins now at 10 o'clock. Here's City News reporter Alex Gouge. The program is anticipated to run until the end of August based on the current status of the virus. This is part of the province-wide plan to provide roughly 760,000 rapid kits to small and medium-sized businesses before Labor Day weekend. Ottawa Board of Trade President and CEO Su Ling Cheng breaks down the benefits of this program. So this is one tool uh, in a toolkit for businesses and one strategy in a suite of strategies to get our economy reopened and keep it stay, uh, keep it open. She adds many similar programs up and running across Ontario have received positive feedback over ease of use from the business community. The kits will be handed out to small businesses with 150 staff or less at Bayview Yards while larger businesses can have the test shipped directly. Alex Gouge, City News. City News Time 10.03 and now your forecast with meteorologist Jill Taylor. We'll have sun and cloud today, the high just 14 degrees below average tonight, mainly clear down to 4 and for the weekend should have plenty of sunshine. Highs 19 Saturday, about 18 Sunday. For today, the high 14. And right now in both Ottawa and Smith Falls, it's 5 degrees. We're expecting a media briefing from the Premier to start in about a half an hour from now. This on the vaccine rollout in Ontario. Now, many have called for a second dose strategy to be upgraded a little bit and the timeline in between doses especially to be moved up. Also, will the supply of AstraZeneca currently in the province get to pharmacies in time for all remaining doses to be given out before they expire? This current batch expires on Monday. Today is also the day health and education stakeholders have been asked to respond to a letter from the Premier asking for their advice on a potential reopening of in-class learning. Now, City News reporter Kevin Meisner joins us from Queen's Park on when we can expect the government to make that decision. Premier Doug Ford has long said any decision he makes is based on the advice of Chief Medical Officer Dr. David Williams, who has said he is in favour of reopening schools. Still, the Premier is seeking a second opinion here. Ford is asking health and education stakeholders in Ontario to tell him where they stand on the idea, and he wants their responses by 5 this afternoon. That, of course, setting up a possible decision and announcement on the situation with schools as early as Monday. The province has always said that schools should be the first to reopen before any other restrictions are lifted. I'm Kevin Meisner. A big drug bust in both Kingston and Elgin has led to charges against a couple of men. Police searched a home on Highway 15 in Elgin and a home in downtown Kingston yesterday, part of an investigation dubbed Project Spectre. Officers seized cocaine, suspected heroin, and 27 grand in cash. 48-year-old Mark Vauden of Elgin and 55-year-old John Vauden of Kingston face charges. That investigation is ongoing. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Talk back. Hello. On the Rob Snow Show. The phone lines are open at 613-750-1310. Now, the Rob Snow Show continues. It's the Friday free-for-all. That is our favorite hour of the week around here. We don't come up with the topics. You come up with the topics. We roll with it. The discussion usually ends up being about something that's been in the news, but that's not a a prerequisite or anything. Uh, If it's been in the news, you want to talk about it, let's talk about it. If it's not in the news, maybe you think it should be in the news. We can talk about it as well. Uh, Maybe you just want to let off some steam. You want to rant. You want to vent. You want to yell at me. Um, I can take that. This is your hour. I turn it over to you. 750-1310, 750-1310, or email the Rob Snow Show at ottawa.citynews.ca. Uh, Jam pack lines already. I like to see that on a Friday morning. Joe in Carlton Place. Joe, good morning. Good morning, sir. How are you doing? I'm good. You're on City News. Joe, what's on your mind? Well, um, what 
that's not getting the news is down in Lindsay at the pods of the prison guards. They, they're on strike down there. They won't go into the, the jail cells, and the prisoners have not been changed. Wow. Clothing for three weeks now. No bedding for three weeks. Ooh. Going dehydrated, and they're not getting fed. At the Lindsay Jail. Yes, it's is, this a uh, provincial jail, I'm guessing, like a remand center, like our Ennis Road Jail here in the Ottawa area? Oh, that's right. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you get, go to jail and then you go there. Sure. And uh, okay. yeah. you know that there's some prisoners there who have not made it in front of a judge yet. Of course, yeah, that's what a remand center is all about, right? Uh, yeah. yeah, if you don't get, if you there. if you can't make bail, that's where the, you know, you're going there to, 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 to wait for your trial date, right? So there are people in that jail who haven't been convicted of anything, right? That so, is correct. And that's yeah. exactly what's going on there now. So, okay. uh, bottom line. How, and it's been going on. I'm not familiar with it, I'll be honest with you. It's been going on for three weeks, you say. I imagine they're unionized by OPSU or what? I'm not yeah. sure who the union is. Okay. Uh, they're, yeah. they're outside on strike. Yeah. Very few are going inside, but no one is being washed. No one right. has any control. And how are you familiar with this, if you don't mind me asking? Me? How did you become familiar with this, if you I don't got, mind? I got a phone call from Lindsay uh, yesterday. Okay. Are, are you, like, involved in the corrections business um, or what? Well, uh, in a way, I'm kind of whistleblowing, so I don't oh, want to say who told okay. me this, but right. uh, I'm sure your man there, Kenny, can find out if it's true or not. Dave, yeah, Dave's our guy. Or Dave, sorry. Yeah, we got two Daves here now. So, okay, sorry yeah. about that. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> right. No, uh, but okay, Joe, very interesting. Uh, we'll see where that goes. Okay. Thank you very much, Rob. Thank you. Yep, yep. Bye. There you go. You know, where, wherever you are, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want, you know, being in jail sucks, but... Um, no guards, no guards on strike. That's not a good scene. New Edinburgh, Glenn, you're on City News. Good morning, Glenn. Good morning, Rob. Yes. My sir. son's an emergency room doc in Vancouver, and his yep. wife's a nurse in the intensive care unit, and both are exhausted. I bet. She says it's like being at the end of a marathon and someone just took away the finish line. Right. Uh, both her parents got COVID and wound up in her ICU. Oh, my God. Her mother God. had to be put on oxygen. The dad had an extreme case. He was intubated and put on a ventilator. Oh my now, he's a retired RCMP. He's a tough guy and in excellent shape. He says he's been shot at and other bad things happened to him, but nothing prepared him for what he went through in the ICU. He was strapped down so he couldn't remove all, all the tubes. He was hallucinating and saw his dead dad. He never thought he would breathe again or see his wife again. He received excellent care, even though the staff were close to burnout. And they're saving lives, and we thank them by kicking them in the groin. People aren't social distancing. People aren't wearing masks. Some people don't want to be vaccinated. He says, please do what the medical people ask of us. And my son uh, says hospital workers no longer feel thanks for saving lives. They're angry at people who don't follow the rules because they're making others sick. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Good words. And uh, so are they doing better now? Have they recovered now? Or? Yeah, they're both back home. Oh, well, that's uh, he good. Has lung okay. damage. And, lung uh, damage. And both of them okay. have uh, br- uh, our shortness of breath. Right. Well, and he says that uh, they both followed all the rules, took all the precautions, but something slipped through the cracks. Yeah. So they don't. They don't really know how they caught it? Or no, they don't. They don't. Uh, okay. And how old would they be? Like 70s, uh, 80s? Maybe, uh, I guess uh, 60s, early 60s. Oh, really? Not even that old? So No. 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 Okay. Well, I'm glad to hear they're on the mend and that they've come out the other side. And I think those those words of um, caution and even frustration are, are well said, Glenn. Thank you. Thank you for your time this morning. Uh, Talk back hour, Rob Snow Show here on City News. 750-1310, 750-1310. Again, I would caution you, okay? Um, you may want, if you have an opinion today, don't wait until the last 15 minutes of the hour or you might lose your shot because we have a live news event that we're probably going to cover if it begins on time. Uh, it's a Doug Ford news conference. It's been scheduled for 1030, but the last couple of times he's scheduled a news conference, it's been way late as it started close to the start time, uh, but it's scheduled for 10.30. And if it starts at 10.30, we'll have no choice but uh, uh, to join it because it'll be a developing news story. Derek in Ottawa on City News. Good morning, Derek. 
Good morning. Yes, sir. I just have a couple a uh, couple things I've noticed um, since the pandemic, and we've all, I think, pretty much knew them. Um, one, our health care is, is lacking, mm-hmm. and, uh, and two, we have too much government. So I'm thinking maybe we should rethink that and uh, shrink the government and uh, increase that spending in health care. Okay. Okay. How do you, do you have any ideas how health care could be better delivered? Well, I do know a lot of people sitting around taking a paycheck that are working for the government doing nothing. So uh, yeah. um, if they're not needed right now, um, maybe in the future you can put that uh, transition all that towards uh, health care and uh, making that better. I mean, anytime I, uh, I've had a couple of back surgeries in the past few so years. So t- you, 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 you want to kind of go through the federal government and take an axe to it kind of thing, right? Well, I mean, uh, yeah. you know, not a, an axe, but chip away at it. Chip and, away. Uh, okay. You know, put it to work. A hatchet toward, then. Uh, okay, a hatchet. Okay. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Where are you? What do you think about private delivery of health care? Private? Private delivery um, of health care. Well, if you have... You know, hey, if somebody if, can if pay for it, them, um, if somebody can pay for their own health care, why, why have the government deliver the health care? Well, I, I, I bring this up, Derek, because I've been thinking yeah. about this number since I first heard it from the Financial Accountability Officer a couple of weeks on the show. Um, you can pretty it, much buy anything else you want. So well, why, uh, why uh, yeah, and we already have healthcare. multiple tiers of health care, but it, because of COVID-19 and the strain it's put on the health care system... In Ontario, there there's now a backlog of diagnostic procedures, like going to get a CT scan or going to get an MRI scan. These kinds of things. It the it, it, it you know how many procedures it is. It's two and a half million of those procedures is the backlog of MRIs, of CTs, these sorts of things. How are we ever going to get caught up on that? They say it's going to take three and a half years just to get caught up on just that one segment of the healthcare system. Well, there you go. Why don't Why don't we let people who are experts in, let's say, MRI clinics, open well, they're, they're, private MRI clinics? Hey, go buy ten MRI machines, and if people want to get a private MRI and pay seven hundred and fifty bucks to go get one, why should we stop them? We got a big backlog we have to clear. You know? Yeah. Well, we already we already have um, over at uh, the Brook Street. There's a doctor's office in there, yeah. and uh, you have to pay. Uh, I think it's. Well, one of my family members did it. You have to pay, I think, two thousand a person to right. become a patient. A patient. Okay. So we already have, we already have. Um, it's already starting. So. Well, sure. I mean, let's say you know the hockey game tomorrow night. Um, Leafs and Habs. You know, we already saw John Tavares get injured. Let's say um, Matthews gets injured for the Leafs. How long do you think he's going to wait? Three and a half years for an MRI. <laughs> well, it doesn't. Ha- it doesn't. Ha- it doesn't happen. Right. You know, you think <laughs> it doesn't I, happen. I, yeah. I, I, I actually have. Uh, I, I don't want to get into, but I know somebody uh, who uh, plays hockey overseas and was able to get surgery uh, within. Of course, of- yeah. Like when John Tavares. And, and look, I, I, you know, I'm not. I, I'm, I don't want to exploit his injury, right? But do you think John Tavares is going to wait three years for an MRI to find out what's wrong with his knee? Yeah, of course, probably not. had an an MRI that night, right? Yeah. Okay, Derek. Thank you. Healthcare. Invest more in healthcare. Yeah, it's a great point. Will will people be open to say a two tiered healthcare system? You know, that's the great devil, right? In Canada, no, we could ever have two tier American style healthcare. Okay, can we have French style healthcare? The the healthcare system in France always ranked the best healthcare system in the world. Routinely ranked the best healthcare system in the world. It has a public system and an accompanying private health care system. And it has health care outcomes that are vastly superior to ours. We have to get over this this myth that Canada has the greatest health care system in the world. But maybe a conversation for another day. I don't want to take up all the time on that one. Uh, Be right back with more of your calls on the Friday Free For All. Rob Snow Show Talk Back Hour here on City News. Thank you. 
Here at the Thirsty Maiden, uh, we offer a variety of products. Uh, so everything from breakfast items, so it's breakfast sandwiches and scones, which have become a staple item here at the cafe. We have an assortment of pastries and cakes and desserts. So we're really big on our dessert bar, which a lot of people come here for. And of course, our delicious coffee beverages. So we do offer uh, not your typical lattes, things like a chocolate banana coconut latte, cinnamon coconut, which is is my favorite and our take on even a pumpkin spice which we add nutmeg and a dash of cayenne in just to give it a bit of a kick when you start a business um, you don't factor in all the things that could go wrong you think anything that goes wrong any failure it's got to be something on your shoulders you didn't market right you're carrying the wrong products you didn't price your items correctly all the things right um, but when this pandemic began things going through my brain were I didn't factor in a pandemic. Um, and we were just starting to grow. We were about to blow up, you know, and I think I spent two days crying. Um, and then I shut my business down for, I think, a period of two or three days. And um, just being at home for those, for, during that time, I realized this is not me. I'm, anybody that knows me knows I'm a, a hard worker. I don't give up and I'm a go-getter. And I started to think, well, I, I should probably just start clearing out my freezers and posting and seeing who wants to buy what. And that was sort of how I built my momentum back up. I realized that there's still a large number of people that wanted to support us and were looking for the items that I had to provide. So we started there, then I reopened literally not even three or four days after I closed my doors and then started doing curbside pickups and deliveries, started doing the deliveries myself, free deliveries to the local community, going as far as Bell's Corners and CARP as well. And, uh, that's why we're still here. This community has really kept us going a year into the pandemic. But we've had a change over staff a couple times now and uh, you know, situations change and you know, when you can't offer hours and staffing, uh, sorry, hours for your employees, you don't blame them when they have to go elsewhere. So I think that's also been one of the challenges is recruiting, training, and then they leave, you know, and then bringing in more people and recruiting and anybody in this industry will, you know, will tell you that that's something we deal with on a regular basis, whether or not COVID's in the mix or not, but um, more so now, because every time there's a lockdown, there's a risk of Will we make it through? And then you lay off more staff. And again, their situations and their circumstances change. It's time to talk back. On the Rob Snow Show. Have your say and call now. 613-750-1310. The Ford government is uh, moving up the vaccine doses by about a month uh, across the board. We're going to have details. It, 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 it can get rather complicated, and I, I don't really have the time to break it down for you right now. I think Premier Ford will have more to say during his news conference. Of course, he's going to have more to say about this during his news conference scheduled to, to begin in about 10 minutes' time. So uh, between now and then, I want to take as many calls as I can because this is the Friday Free For All Talk Back Hour. Uh, Hussein, good morning. Hussein, you're on City News. Hey, good morning, Earl. Hey. Uh, yeah, I want to talk about, uh, you know, the money they were giving out to Mark Motors? Yes, I'm familiar um, with it, yeah. That was, yeah, that was just one business. Do you know how many businesses they give out uh, just in Venya in a year? I don't know how many in a year. No, Because if that's such a, that amount of sum is quite a bit for yeah. one business, sure. right? I, I, I don't mind, you know, them getting it because they went through official uh, way to get it. Yeah. But what I mean is that what if there is like 100 businesses applying? Like, are they giving out a hundred million dollars every year? No, no, no. I don't think it would. I don't think it would be that much. But um, nevertheless, I can tell you something. I mean, this Mark Motors thing. I mean, is small potatoes compared to what's called the Brownfields program. So let's say there's a, a vacant parcel of land and it needs to be um, remediated. It needs to go through some remediation because maybe it's contaminated. Okay, maybe it was an old gas station at some point or whatever, and there there may be. Yeah toxins in the in the soil or whatever yeah uh and but it'd make a great spot for an apartment building or a condo tower or something we have what's called a brownfields program to spur development that that has now become 70 million dollars a year that program 
So do you know if they're asking existing businesses that deal with that kind of waste to pay more in property tax? I don't know. Because that would make sense, right? Every Everyone that's, because in the end, it's the city that pays for the cleaning right. in this brownfield. So they could charge all the businesses right now who has that kind of... Uh, Business to pay more in property tax and put it yeah. into a, a fund to That's offset the, the cost of the Brownfields program. Yeah, 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 I suppose so. Yeah, okay, and, thank and, you. And, yeah, and I, you. I got you, Hussein. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Yep, I appreciate your call, sir. Uh, again, Doug Ford News Conference, 1030. So it's the Friday Free For All Talk Back Hour. If you want to have your say for this week on any topic at all, this is the perfect time to do it because I'm not sure if this pro- if this news conference starts on time, we'll be able to take calls between uh, 10.30 and noon. So I'd love to hear from you right now. Anne in Ottawa. Anne. Morning, Anne. Um, more, good morning. Yeah. Um, I don't think that guy has to worry that was talking about cutting federal government jobs. I'm, I'm sure the back room and Justin Trudeau, uh, his, his uh, war room, they're already planning it once they win an election. Because remember in the 90s? 40,000 federal government workers were cut. I was was one of them. And I was a permanent employee. I was still cut, and I was shuffled from one department over to another, and it turned out to be a good thing. But I'm I'm expecting it. But, of course, he won't do it till he wins the election. So that's just a given. I don't know. Do you think Mr. Trudeau has the the fortitude, quite frankly, that uh, Mr. Kretschmer and Mr. Martin did? Where are they do they, do get they the seem money? like cutters to you, um, uh, Mr. Trudeau and uh, Christopher Freeland? Do they? Do you think they're gonna uh, like mow down the public service the way? I mean, I remember those days too. They laid, you know, Crutchy and Martin laid off nine thousand people at the CBC just mm-hmm, to, just at mm-hmm. the CBC. Well, it's either um, they're going to have to cut some employees or they're going to have to tax the crap out of us. I, I could see either one. What's more likely? What's more likely? Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm not really happy about that. Um, and we absolutely are going to have to go to two-tiered health care. I don't care. I mean, someone shouldn't care. If I can afford, afford to pay 100 bucks to get something done, then that makes the list shorter for somebody else, the line shorter for somebody else that waits in it the public. It may be inevitable. It may be inevitable. But the other thing I wanted to talk about, this is quite important. And we should not, if I could just say, Sorry. it should not be viewed as something that is so taboo. They do it all over the world. I know. In I modern, know. Western, even more socialist countries than our own. They, they have they have parallel health care systems. So. But the other thing I wanted to talk about was there's a really important cohort um, that of people over, I think, 80. You remember when they were first getting vaccines and they were being handled by the city and they were actually being called to go and get there? Well, because they, it wasn't done through the provincial portal, those people do not have a second shot booked. Oh. So And they can't get them now because the appointments are taken. So I think between the city and the province, they're going to have to figure out a way when they get the vaccines and they're going to have to prioritize those people for their second shots. I, I, I'm, I'm amazed someone isn't on this because anytime someone tries looking into it, from what I understand, I've, this is just anecdotal hearsay, right. but they're told by both the city and the province there's nothing we can do because the second shot should have been booked when the first one was. Okay. And that's a little bit kind of not very short of incompetence. So I think they're just going to have to deal with that. I mean, that's a very vulnerable population, people over 80. Sure. So okay. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. You. Yep. Yeah. Yep. According to this chart that D- David has handed me from the Ford government, when it comes to second shots, it says 80 plus. Uh, the new timeline is they want second shots. Is this finished, Dave, by June 21st? Is this finished by June 21st? Is that how I'm reading that? I don't know if it if it means it's going to begin by June twenty first or it ends on June twenty first. Gosh, it's so confusing. Um, Isaac in Kingston, go ahead, Isaac. You're on City News. Hey, Rob. Hi. So you know, there's there's one thing that really bugs me as being a Canadian. Okay. And you look at our country and you look at how rich we are in our resources. Sure. Right. We can all agree on that. We're, Absolutely. We're lucky. We we have very many mineral deposits and oil deposits and and so on third largest oil reserve in the world sir in the world but but how how do we use it we don't we still ship in all this oil we're still reliant on the u.s in this 
this line five that Biden's going to shut down on us now. Oh, well, the governor of you Michigan. Know? Yeah. Yeah. OK. Yeah. And then and then you, you look back even further and how reliant we are on on other countries. And you look at earlier in the pandemic when the countries that are producing these these um, um, commodities. Yep. Yes. And they're. You know they're putting the kibosh on it and saying, "Well, it, we're not giving any any to you before we get it." Yep. You know what, how 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 bad is it that Canada can't fend for itself? In, in it's these pretty times? bad. We're, it's pretty bad. You think about that. We have the world's. Itself. If I could just interrupt here, we have the world's third largest oil reserve. Uh, when when it comes to pipeline infrastructure, which is hardly all brand new, <laughs> we have 900,000 kilometers of pipeline in the ground in Canada already. 900,000 kilometers of the stuff. And yet our, our entire energy security for everything east of Sarnia is threatened because of four and a half miles of pipe that we don't even control. It's our oil. We can't even get it. We might not even be able to get it. It's crazy, Isaac. It's absolute insanity. You're right. It's absolute insanity. We should be more self-sufficient. I totally agree with you. And a whole host of things, the economic opportunity that is threatened or even lost because of it uh, is astronomical. I'm going to take one more before the bottom of, of the hour news. And it's uh, Kempville and it's Ed. Good morning, Ed. Good morning, Rob. Yes, sir. First of all, I am in favor of lockdowns as long as they're fair. Okay. Last, last Sunday, I'm driving through town, and there's a farmer market that's going on there. Yep. 100 people, some with masks, some without masks. Mm. Now, okay. restaurants are out there, and they're spending thousands of dollars to have people separated eating outside. Yes. They this money on the plastic, but they can't open. I've got a friend that's getting married this coming Sunday, and he can't get his refund. It's been put off a year. And, but anyways, he can only, it's an outdoor wedding. He can only have 10 people. Mm. So the wedding party has to be cut because you got the priest, you got the, the, the bride, the groom, and the wedding party and parents. So you can't have them there. So where is the evenness in this? Why would you have a farmer's market with 150 people walking around? If your friend can't have a wedding with any more than what? 10 people, right? Yeah. 10 people. And not only that, like he, he can't get his deposit back. Okay, he's he, he's put down the five thousand. He can't if he cancels the wedding. It's gone anyways. Yeah. But not only that, he and his wife are the only ones that can eat a meal thereafter. Right. <laughs> what the hell is going on? How can you have a farmers market? You can't have restaurants with all the plastic that these people have spent. <laughs> you can't oh, have a thousands. Yeah, 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 of course. Okay, oh, sir, you, you want a little more consistency, if at all, right, at this yeah. point. Yeah, okay, thank you, Ed. Thank you. Look, um, that, that was a busy half hour. I don't know. We're going to fly by the seat of our pants for the second half hour because Doug Ford has called this 1030 News Conference. Will it start at 1030? Well, I guess we'll wait and see. It's like 30 seconds from now. Rob Snow Show, City News.
local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Friday, May 28th. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa and in Smith Falls, it's 5 degrees, and here's what's making news this hour. New numbers today in Ontario show 1,273 more COVID-19 cases today from some 40,900 tests. 101 of these cases are in Ottawa, back over 100 for the first time in a few days. 13 in the Eastern Ontario Health Unit, two more cases in both Leeds, Grenville, Lanark and Renfrew Health Units. 14 more people have died, according to the province. Now, the numbers come on the day. Premier Ford, who is addressing media right now, we'll go to that shortly, talks about vaccine rollout. As some push for the timeline between doses to be moved up, that apparently will be moved up at least one month from four uh, months between doses to three. But it could be also as short as 28 days. Also, the AstraZeneca shots, they're due to expire Monday. They have to be in people's arms before that day. And there's the issue of school stakeholders. They have until five this afternoon to get their thoughts on in-class learning, resuming or not, by five this afternoon so the government can make its decision. We're also getting new modeling numbers from the federal government today. Federal health officials releasing the figures as the vaccine campaign continues to increase and the number of infections decreases. City News Time 1033. I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Talk back. Hello. On the Rob Snow Show. The phone lines are open at 613-750-1310. Now, the Rob Snow Show continues. I would ask you to just hold off on uh, your phone calls right now because we have a live breaking news event. This is Premier Doug Ford. Uh, outlining the latest on a number of issues, including the vaccination program. This is live on City News. Vulnerable will begin offering Ontarians their second doses on a first come, first base, first in, first out basis. That means we'll expand second doses based on the day you received your first. As we do, we're reducing the time between your first and second dose down from the current 16 weeks to as soon as four weeks after your first shot. Of course, this depends on the vaccine supply and the availability of appointments in your region. So while not everyone will be able to get their second dose shot four weeks after their first, we want to ensure you're fully immunized as soon as possible. This is extremely important news. It means more protection from this horrible virus sooner. It means we can begin getting back to doing the things we love. And it means we're all getting one step closer to returning to normal. Because the faster we deliver vaccines, the faster we can put this pandemic behind us for good. We see what's happening in other places where people have been fully vaccinated. Well, the good news is that can be us. Based on what we know about upcoming shipments, everyone in Ontario who wants a vaccine could be fully vaccinated by the end of August. That's right, friends, Ontario is ready to deliver a two-dose summer. But I want to I, I want to make sure uh, to go faster, and we're going to do everything we can to go faster, and we will make sure we get the needles into people's arms as soon as possible. We can further accelerate second doses in Ontario. All we need is more supply. Everything is in place, and we're ready to go. All we need are the vaccines because we're in a race against the new, more dangerous variants. While one dose provides some protection against these variants, it doesn't provide nearly as much as two shots. So as we speed up our rollout, we need the federal government to heed our call. We need them to fix the problems at the borders. Yesterday, an expert panel weighed in on our borders. They made one thing clear, the measures in place at Canada's borders have failed Canadians. The rules are inconsistent. They're full of loopholes. The federal government has been put on notice by its own experts. And last night, I raised this issue once again directly with a Prime Minister. I've been demanding a federal strategy to protect our borders for months now. So far, we've seen zero response from the Prime Minister. And it's unacceptable. 
And just like during the third wave, we in Ontario could end up paying the price for their inaction on the borders. Now, before we take questions, I want to address an issue that I know is on the top of parents' minds, and it's on the top of my mind as well. No one wants kids back in school more than I do, but we have to ensure that any decision is based on sound scientific and medical advice that protects students and staff in schools. Ontario is not an island. The introduction of new, more dangerous variants into our communities through Canada's borders poses real risks to our schools. That's why this week I wrote to the experts in health, public health and education asking for their input. I've always said Ontario has the best minds in the world. Together we make the best decisions. So I look forward to hearing back from our experts and using their input to make the decision that best protects our students and school staff. Nothing matters more. Thank you and God bless the people of Ontario. We'll go to the phone line for questions. First question, please. From Rob Ferguson at the Toronto Star. Please go ahead. Hi, Rob. Hi, Premier. On, on the schools, um, uh, yesterday Dr. Williams was saying that uh, the, most of the uh, uh, health units are, are, are ready to roll on schools. He's ready to roll on schools. You, you always say that you listen to Dr. Williams. So uh, with what you were saying just now, are you afraid to make a decision of your own on reopening school? No, I've never been afraid to make decisions. Matter of fact, I've made some of the toughest decisions and probably not popular decisions, but we're there to protect the, the health of the people of Ontario and our decisions, uh, as, you, as you've seen with the advice of the health experts, have brought the cases uh, down lower. All I want, Rob, is uh, I know very clearly where Dr. Williams stands, but I want the scientists to weigh in. I want to make sure that the teachers' unions weigh in. I want uh, other educational uh, workers to weigh in. I, I just, you know, I don't want to rush this. If it takes a couple extra days, so be it. This is a massive decision. This is a decision that's going to affect every single person in Ontario. We know that 25% of families have at least one child in, in uh, everywhere from kindergarten to uh, grade 12. Uh, but that 25%, they're going to affect the other 75%. So we want to be very, very cautious. The science table has uh, said that we open the schools, these numbers are going up. And I'm really concerned about the variants. Uh, we weren't dealing with uh, the, the deadly Indian variant uh, a few months ago. We're dealing with it now. And uh, I'm concerned that uh, as, as the expert panel, the federal expert panel came back and, and said, uh, you know, the, the, there is basically no plan for the federal borders. And that's, that's unacceptable, in my opinion. People are coming in. We saw the Indian variant, Rob go up in the last two weeks 600 percent those are staggering staggering numbers and i mentioned this to the prime minister it was like uh, as far as he was concerned there, there didn't seem like there was a problem it was like one of those things okay folks nothing's happening here just keep moving on pretend the borders aren't aren't happening i'm sorry this could cause a fourth wave if we don't uh, tighten up the borders it's absolutely critical follow up Understood. Thanks, Premier. Thank um, what do you say to the critics, though, that who, who are saying that you're you're doing this because uh, uh, you put out this appeal uh, for this uh, consensus because you're 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 looking for someone else to blame if uh, if reopening of schools goes south? Rob, let me tell you right from the get go. I've I've come up here and I haven't heard too many other elected officials say this. At the end of the day, buck stops with me. I'm responsible for the for the good things. I give all the credit to the frontline healthcare workers. If things go a little sideways, I'll take responsibility, which I have. And if they don't go the right way, I'll get up and apologize and correct it immediately. Um, and, and saying that, we want the experts. This is a big, big decision, folks. We're talking for the next uh, few weeks. Kids are going to go in school. And I want to make sure the kids are safe. I want to make sure that the teachers are safe because we have some great, great teachers in this province. Um, and then it gets into the community. And this Indian variant uh, that, that came in through our borders, um, you know, that this gonna, it's going to cause an issue. When, when I have the science table, Dr. Brown uh, told me directly, Doug, this could be 6 to 11% increase. That could equal to thousands of cases. 
Folks, do you want to go backwards again? I don't. I want to look forward. I want to make sure, looking forward, that uh, we're able to get the kids in camp. I, I want to look forward to make sure we have a, a great September for the kids to go back into school. Um, and and this, this could affect our, our uh, opening as well. So I want to make sure all the T's are crossed, I's are dotted, and I'm going to be super cautious and over, over a couple extra days, uh, folks, it's well worth it, um, make, getting a consensus from everyone. Next question. From Lorenda Redekop at CBC News. Please go ahead. Hi, Lorenda. Hi there, Premier. From the technical briefing, it sounds like there's no plan to assist seniors to ensure that they can have a sped up second dose. We've heard from experts that this is crucial to protecting those people who are most at risk, but they'll have to be going through the online system or the phone again. Why doesn't your government have a plan to to help them? Well, we, we have a very strong uh, plan in place, and that's how we were able to really hammer out these vaccines. I've always said right from the get-go, give us the vaccines. Uh, you know, and we'll, we'll get them into people's arms. The, the people on the front lines, the healthcare workers that are putting needles into people's arms, the paramedics, the firefighters, and, and mobile units, um, this is nothing less than spectacular what they've done. I've never seen a well, more well-oiled machine in every single person I've talked to. Uh, no matter if they're seniors or, or not seniors, they said it was seamless, they were friendly, they went in, they got the needle, they went out, and uh, everyone gets all the credit. I, I, I don't need the credit. Uh, they're, they're the champions. But I'm going to pass this over to the Minister of Health and uh, on that. Thank you. Well, thank you. We are um, accelerating the uh, the doses for people 80 plus uh, starting next week, making sure that uh, they have the opportunity, if they wish, to uh, book their second appointment um, sooner than what they already have, the date that they already have. If they choose not to do so, they don't need to do so. But there are very many ways that they can uh, obtain a second shot appointment through pharmacies, through primary care pr practitioners, through the online booking tool, through the phone lines. Uh, we didn't have a problem with uh, people 80 plus getting their first doses organized and we're sure that their second doses won't be a problem either. Follow-up? There are tens of thousands of AstraZeneca doses we know will be expiring on Monday. Could you give us a number of how many you expect will end up being wasted? And we have been hearing concerns from pharmacists that they didn't know what was going to happen. So if there are doses that will be wasted, how much will be because of uh, bad communication? So the second doses of AstraZeneca that at this point are set to expire on May 31st, we wanted to offer those to people to, who wished to have a shortened time period of the 10 weeks, which is why we were very specific about saying, if you had your first dose of AstraZeneca between May 10th and May 19th, you have an opportunity, if you would like, to receive that AstraZeneca sooner, that second dose sooner. Uh, it is a very limited supply, but because the AstraZeneca had been distributed throughout Ontario at this point, when federal, when Health Canada put a pause on using AstraZeneca for first doses, we had to return that AstraZeneca to the three zones in Ontario, the three communities, Kingston, Toronto and Windsor-Essex that had offered the original first dose. So it was a matter of moving them back into those three communities, making sure that they still had the cold storage um, chain, that they were safe. We've done that and that work is ongoing. And as soon as we get the approval that they continue to be of the highest quality, we make sure that um, pharmacies in Toronto, Kingston, and Windsor, Essex are getting it. I know people are excited. I know that a lot of people want that second dose sooner, but it is a very limited supply that we are offering up to make sure that we use all available doses. Thank you. 
Yeah, just to add in, in Solicitor General, it's March the 10th to the 19th. I think you accidentally said May the Don't. 10th. Sorry. So anyways, just want to reinforce that. March the 10th to March the 19th. Uh, if you ended up getting an AstraZeneca shot, then you're, you're eligible. And again, uh, that, that's Kingston, Windsor, and Toronto, because that's the time frame, the 10 to 12 week time frame. And uh, as, we, as we get more, we're going to start rolling it out uh, based on the dates. Uh, that the doctors prescribe. Next question. From Richard Southern at 680 News. Please go ahead. Hi, Richard. Hey, Premier, how are you? I'm doing good. How are you? Good thing. Good. I've talked to some restaurant owners who are ready, to, staffing-wise, to open their patios in the next couple of days. The vaccination rates are where you wanted them to be for step one. So, Premier, are you prepared to uh, relax some of these restrictions, like patios, and let them open before June 14th? Well, we're going to work closely on the guidelines, and that was uh, June June the 14th, and and hit those targets. Uh, it's not just the, uh, the there's more than just the 65 percent and the second doses. We we have to look at the ICU capacity, and thank goodness we see it coming down. We have to look at the positivity rate. So there's a, a lot of other factors involved. I, I, I got to tell the business owners. Um, I, I've said this before. Uh, Mortality weighs on you more than anything. Uh, anyone anywhere secondly are these businesses it kills me to keep these businesses closed but i have to for the long term uh you know protect everyone's health for the short-term pain that we're going to face over the next maybe a couple of weeks uh there's light at the end of the tunnel and everyone in ontario knows we're going to be opening up, but we're going to open up cautiously and, and carefully, uh, very cautiously and very carefully, because I do not want to happen what, what happened before and all of a sudden the, the cases go up. And there are all the elected officials that are out there right now that are listening to this. I remember back in March, you're all saying, open up, open up, open up. And you know something, as soon as those numbers went up, everyone just dove for cover. And uh, so we're going to make sure we're going to be cautious. Follow-up? Uh, Premier, you know, since we're talking about second doses here today, there's always going to be a group of people who don't want to get the vaccine. There's been talk in other jurisdictions about offering them incentives, lottery and what have you. Are you in favor of that in Ontario? And also, any more thought given to what, you know, a so-called vaccine passport, a proof of vaccination that would be required to do certain things in the province, Premier? Well, first of all, the vaccine passport, that's going to be a federal issue. They had that discussion last night with the premiers, and it's an open uh, discussion on, on that for the federal government. And uh, so that, that's what we're going to... Uh that's what we're going to wait for the federal government to, to come out on, on that uh, as well. Next question. From Camille Camarali at Global News. Please go ahead. Sorry about the last reporter. I think I didn't answer his first question. My I question. apologize. Um, you know, uh, there's already been a lot of criticism after the tech briefing related to this rollout and just the confusing uh, chart of it. And a lot of people are drawing it back to the first dose rollout. So, um, I guess the question remains, uh, didn't the province learn its lesson the first time? It, it, it's tough to read. It's tough to understand for a lot of people. How is the general public expected to understand this? Wow, we're going to fully and respectfully disagree. Talk about the rollout. This has been nothing but spectacular, getting 8.5 million people vaccinated, uh, getting numbers up to 180,000 to 190,000 a day. I don't think you, you comprehend uh, the logistics of putting, uh, uh, filling 180,000 syringes, the size of Ontario, the 15 million people. We're pumping it out. As the chart showed, and we'll send you over the chart, we're ranking in the best in the world on this. Um, you know, as, as the, the Minister of Health just mentioned, you have your phone line, you can go online, you can walk into a pharmacy, you can go to your primary care, you, and some hospitals are giving it out. Like, eight and a half million people figured out how to get it, and we're going to make it just as easy as long as we get supply. I t I'm going to give you a quick two-second two story here. I talked to someone in one of the big automotive manufacturers. I said, imagine doing this, and he said, I, I, I can't figure out how you, you, you manage the logistics. Just imagine trying to build a car, and I'll use Moderna, for example. We don't know when the next Moderna shipment's coming in. We don't know when the next AstraZeneca shipment's coming in. And, and we're, we're trying to uh, deal with three variants and, and getting people vaccinated all in different locations. 
um, you know, that, that, that's, how, that, that's how sophisticated this gets. But, you know, I, I'm going to pass this over to the, the Solicitor okay. General. Uh, and while he does that, we'll, be, we'll take a quick break here. We'll be right back. This is Doug Ford's news conference on vaccines and everything else. This is the Rob Snow Show on City News. So the birth of absinthe was uh, 2002, I think, 2003. And I was working at Urban Bistro um, happily, uh, where uh, Allium is now. Uh, and then uh, the space where Holland Cafe was uh, came up. It's on the corner of Spencer and Holland. And uh, I spoke to the landlord and there's a lot of interest from a lot of other people, but he and I just you know, got along super well and he Put a lot of faith in me so uh, Carmen Turner is his name he uh, he gave me the lease to the place and, and really pretty much gave me all the equipment in the place I was really lucky I've been really lucky with landlords that way actually both my current landlord and Carmen Turner because um, if there hadn't been Carmen Turner there wouldn't have been absinthe so we were there for a few years uh, and just sort of outgrew the place and then now we're here it's obviously been tough and it's been tough for everyone I mean that's the you know, for it's the, been the big democratic sweep of like in restaurants and the hospitality and the arts that we were talking about earlier. It's like everybody's been impacted pretty much the same um, from everybody that I talked to. We're down 80, 75, 80 percent. We're, and we're climbing out now. Um, I think the one of the saddest things is like we like everybody, we went down to two employees from 25 um, and we're now at four and we're bringing two new people on this week. So we'll be at six. So it's, you know, little steps. So it's been tough. It's, you know, um, I've got the most expensive uh, clubhouse ever here because some days you come and you don't do any business, but you're here. But I'm, I'm grateful for what I do have. I think everybody's optimistic now, um, n- not necessarily just about the vaccine, but about like the, the vaccine spring being able to be outside I think you're gonna see a lot of like pop-up things happen in parking lots and on sidewalks and all and like that rather than being actually inside somebody's commerce I think we'd like to take it outside Um, I know my staff would my staff like the outdoors now all of a sudden all four of us Um, six soon Uh, but um, we'll, we'll be doing stuff some business in the patio in the parking lot and we have a patio up front and I think other and I hope other restaurants and stores will do the same I hope that they take advantage of like the sidewalk and doing sort of you know know, guerrilla marketing and stuff like that and really shaking it up a bit you can find us at Absinthe Cafe at 1208 Wellington Street West in Hindenburg and you can find us online at absinthecafe.ca Time to talk back on the Rob Snow Show. Have your say and call now. 613-750-1310. Again, this is a live news event on City News. The Premier, Doug Ford, holding a news conference right now along with members of his cabinet. So it is possible to do that yourself. You will be contacted the health the minister, regular Christine time. Elliott. But if you wish to do it within the shortened time period, if you're eligible for that, then you can certainly go ahead and arrange that. Okay, we're going to pass it over to the Solicitor General as well. The only thing I would add is that, you know, part of our goal with offering multiple pathways for getting your vaccine was choice, convenience. And so as we have continued to expand the pharmacy model, by the end of the month, we're going to have upwards of 2,400 pharmacies across Ontario. And again, when they have sufficient inventory, individuals who perhaps got their first dose at a pop-up clinic near their place of work might opt to go to their their neighborhood pharmacy. And that is perfect perfectly fine because as Minister Elliott pointed out, you are registered in COVAX. So we know exactly the type of vaccine that you received, when you received it, and when you're when you qualify for the uh, clinical advice on when your second dose happens, you will be able to choose the most convenient model for your uh, for to be flexible and convenient for you. Thank you. Last question. 
from Christina Rowan at CTTV. Please go ahead. Hey, Christina. Good morning, Premier. Oh, Hi. Um, I just want to go back to Lorendo's question, and yep. I guess this is the question for the Solicitor General. How many doses or will any doses of AstraZeneca expire on May 31st? It's not a clear-cut answer, and the reason I say that is as the AstraZeneca was pulled back in to be distributed in Kingston, Toronto, and Windsor-Essex, before they were redistributed, they are being checked to ensure their quality. Uh, we want to make sure that that second dose is of the highest quality. We're taking the time to do that, and as lots are approved, and thousands have, have already happened, um, then they get distributed to the pharmacies in Toronto, Kingston and Windsor but it, I can't give you a hard answer on how many we expect will not be able to go through that quality assurance piece but I think it's really important that we understand how critically uh, important that is we want to make sure that the doses we are we are offering for second doses are checked first for quality assurance and we're doing that now follow-up and then just going back to the Moderna what do you say to all of those residents who have received the Moderna because there still isn't any clarity coming from um, NACI uh, as to what to do next? So what do you want to say to them with only 21,000 doses coming? Yeah, that, that, this, that's exactly and, and great question, question, Christina, because that's exactly uh, what I was mentioning on the line yesterday. There's inconsistency on, on supply. Um, how do you build a product when you don't know when you're getting the parts in? And right now we have uh, no uh, line of sight whatsoever when the Moderna, someone said, when's Moderna coming in? Isn't it a shame that no premier in this country can tell you when it's coming in? Uh, that, that's a game changer because if we get this Moderna in, Man, that, that, that's going to that's going to really accelerate the the doses. It's going to bring down the the gap of waiting for your second dose. Um, uh, so right now we we know what we're getting in Pfizer. We don't know when the next shipment of AstraZeneca is coming in, which always makes it challenging. It makes it very difficult when we don't we don't know when Moderna is coming in. You know, I, I just I just want clarity from the the federal government. That's all we're asking for, and it makes life so much easier. Uh, folks, when, when you see, when you saw that we were getting supplies of Moderna, Pfizer, and AstraZeneca, uh, Team Ontario just pumped, pumped these vaccines out like I've never seen before. Uh, so give us the ammunition, and we'll make sure we get the, the needles into people's arms. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to wrap this up. Folks, we're going in the right direction. And all thanks to each and every one of you following the guidelines. I know the guidelines were tough, but there's proof in the pudding here. The numbers are coming down. We're going to get back to normal. We're going to make sure that we have a great July, a great August. Okay. Uh, we're going to make sure every decision is based on moving forward on a cautious decision. We want the kids in camp on, on the beginning of July. And and we want people to get back to normal. So just hang in there. Everyone's doing great. Frontline healthcare workers, your champions, and the people of Ontario have done an incredible job. So thank you, and God bless you. Have a great, safe week. Okay, let's leave that. So Premier of Ontario, his news conference uh, wrapping up actually pretty well for us just before the 11 o'clock news. Uh, a lot to cover off. We'll review it uh, when we come back. Nothing on uh, a return to school. Nothing about accelerated timelines in, in terms of uh, at the reopening of the economy. Lots of shots at the Trudeau government and uh, some details on the vaccination program. We'll go through it all. The news is next here on City News.
WW 1310 AM in Ottawa. And CJET 1011 FM in Smith Falls and the Valley. Number one for local news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News. Now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Friday, May 28th. Good morning. I'm Andrew Boyle. Right now in Ottawa, 5 degrees. It's 6 in Smith Falls. And here's what's making news in Ottawa and the Valley. Premier Doug Ford says the vaccine rollout schedule has been moved up. Everyone in Ontario who wants to be doubly vaccinated will have those shots by the end of summer. But he says there is a big if as long as vaccine supply meets that demand. Premier Ford says we are in a race, and if supply arrives, the time between your shots will be shortened. We're reducing the time between your first and second dose, down from the current 16 weeks to as soon as four weeks after your first shot. Of course, this depends on the vaccine supply and the availability of appointments in your region. Now, the Premier goes on to say this does provide news about the end of this journey. It means we can begin getting back to doing the things we love. And it means we're all getting one step closer to returning to normal. Now, Ford also will be pouring over recommendations from those in the medical and education fields. He has asked for their feedback to be sent to him by 5 o'clock this afternoon on whether it is okay to reopen schools before the end of the year. So I want to make sure all the T's are crossed, I's are dotted, and I'm going to be super cautious. And over, over a couple extra days, uh, folks, it's well worth it, um, make, getting a consensus from everyone. Doug Ford says he just wants to make sure we go forward, not backward, with this pandemic. Now, where is the country headed with the pandemic and how quickly will we be able to return to normal? We may get a better sense a little bit later today. Federal health officials are releasing the latest COVID modeling. Here's City News Parliament Hill reporter Cormac McSweeney. Canada's Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Teresa Tam, will be on hand to release the new pandemic numbers, giving us a report on the current status of this health crisis and an idea of the future trajectory. It's likely to be a much rosier picture than last month's projection, which showed Canada was still in the midst of a third wave with rising variants, but since then several provinces have seen their numbers decline significantly thanks to strict lockdowns and public health measures. At the vaccine update yesterday, Dr. Tam's deputy, Dr. Howard New, also said the country's getting closer to the first milestone for lifting restrictions. That is, 75% of those eligible for vaccines have one dose and 20% have two doses or are fully vaccinated. By continuing this momentum, we can look forward to small outdoor gatherings with family and friends this summer. According to Our World in Data, almost 55% of Canadians have received at least their first dose, but only 5% are fully vaccinated. Cormac McSweeney, Parliament Hill. And I'm Andrew Boyle for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. Firm. Fair. Fun. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News, 1011 FM and 1310 AM. So Premier Ford has just had his news conference. We're going to talk about it a lot during our Queen's Park Weekend Review with our MPPs, which is coming up right after the 1130 news here on the Rob Snow Show. Uh, he is promising a two-dose summer. Not a one-dose summer, a two-dose summer, and he says there's no reason why everyone can't be vaccinated. 12-plus can't be vaccinated, everyone in the province, by the end of August. But he spent a lot of his time during this news conference going after the federal government, going after the Trudeau government, uh, particularly on two issues, supply of vaccines and the borders, the borders. So as we speed up our rollout, we need the federal government to heed our call. We need them to fix the problems at the borders. Those are staggering, staggering numbers. And I mentioned this to the prime minister. It was like, as far as he was concerned, there, there didn't seem like there was a problem. And I'm really concerned about the variants. Uh, we weren't dealing with uh, the, the deadly Indian variant uh, a few months ago. We're dealing with it now. The federal expert panel came back and, and said, uh, you know, the, the, there is basically no plan for the federal borders. Okay. Just a taste of it. Um, so the federal government, heed our call, fix the problems at the borders. Quote, we have seen zero response from the prime minister. We could end up paying the price, Ford said. He was asked about schools. We thought there might be some news out of this news conference about schools. 
he was asked by a reporter from the Toronto Star, um, are you afraid to make decisions? You always ha- you've always said that you rely on the advice, you follow the advice of Dr. Williams. He's the chief medical officer of health from the province. Dr. Williams has said that he- he's ready to recommend the schools. He thinks schools should open. We have medical officers of health from one end of the province to the other. All of them here in eastern Ontario are saying schools can open. Uh, so he was asked, are you afraid to make decisions? And he said, no, I've never been afraid to make a tough decision. I make some of the toughest decisions, but that he wants to see a consensus, that he's worried about variants, and that he's worried about borders, that uh, cases of the Indian variant are up 600% recently in the province of Ontario. Uh, so then he was asked a follow-up question, are you looking for someone else to blame in, in case you... You know, you re, let's say you reopen schools and there's a, a spike in cases if the reopening goes bad. Uh, and he said, no, it's a big decision, folks. Quote, it's a big, big decision. I want to make sure the kids are safe. I want to make sure teachers are safe. Um, but do we really want to go back again was uh, one of his lines. Do we really want to go back again? He spent a lot of time talking about supply. He was asked by the public broadcaster about the plan to accelerate the second dose for seniors. He talked again about su- supply, praised uh, all the frontline workers uh, at vaccination clinics, paramedics, nurses, etc. But again, he went over. The, he went uh, after the Trudeau government about a lack of supply of uh, vaccines, and then he was asked about expiring AstraZeneca doses. That we know that. Astra, there's a, there is a, a small supply of AstraZeneca doses that are about to expire on Monday, but still, as to say, it's 45,000 doses. That's enough to vaccinate, you know, a small city in the province of Ontario. And it was hard to, I found it hard to nail them down on that, about what, exactly what the situation is. Uh, Sylvia Jones repeatedly took that one and said it was about quality control, that vaccines need to be um, inspected for quality control. But um, for the most part, he had praise for the province's vaccination program, praise for, quote unquote, Team Ontario, eight and a half million doses, and said it would have been better if there was more supply, if only the supply was more reliable. He said, uh, no premier ever knows when the next shipment is going to come in or how many doses will be with each uh, shipment. He compared it to um, an auto plant. He said, you know, try try to build a car without knowing uh, when or if you will have the parts. So that's basically the summary of Premier Ford's news conference, final hour here of the uh, Rob Snow Show. And uh, joining us now on the line for uh, some immediate reaction and the latest on what is happening at uh, pharmacies across Ontario with the vaccination program is the CEO of the Ontario Pharmacists Association, Justin Bates. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks yeah, if, uh, thank you for being patient, sir. I just wanted to kind of give the the Coles Notes version of the Premier's news conference a lot of uh, material to go over. Um, were you paying attention to that? Were you listening to uh, the Premier, watching the Premier at all? or? Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And what do you and take away from thing, it, Mr. Bates? What do you take away from what you just heard then from the premier? The first thing that happens when uh, government has a press conference is the phones start to ring uh, very loudly in pharmacy. And um, people are now inquiring about getting an earlier or second dose. And we're still trying to work through the expiring AZ early second dose uh, challenge that we have right now. But, um, you know, what, what I think about is that are they going to give us more supply? Because supply is the rate limiting factor. Um, we're still very limited in what we are receiving through pharmacies, uh, whether it's the mRNA vaccines or AstraZeneca for second dose. And uh, it's great to uh, it's great to have these announcements, and it's an important step. But um, we don't have enough supply to meet that demand, and we're being inundated with requests. Okay. So let's talk specifically about these expiring AstraZeneca doses. What can you tell me about your the situation on the ground? What are your member pharmacies telling you about the situation across Ontario with these expiring AstraZeneca doses, Mr. Bates? Well, the first thing they're, they're experiencing is uh, very, very high demand. Um, and I think a lot of confusion out there on what this program is and will 
will I get my second shot if I don't uh, get one in the next four days? And, and I think that confusion is leading to some panic and uh, anger that's being uh, directed toward uh, healthcare professionals. And, and the, the reality is that this is a this this last week is a expiring AstraZeneca vaccine strategy. It's not a, a fulsome second dose strategy. And what I mean by that is to say we have 30,000 of them in pharmacy that we're trying to get into arms before the end of uh, Monday. So that opened up the opportunity for a certain cohort of people to get an early second dose. But there is more supply coming and it'll be coming over the next two weeks to make sure that everyone else will get an opportunity to get their regularly scheduled when eligible second dose of AstraZeneca. So it's not a a one-shot deal here in the next four days. Okay. No government is ever going to admit it. Yeah, we have to throw some vaccine out. Uh, That would just be uh, so politically damaging. But how likely do you think it is that some of these AstraZeneca doses could spoil, uh, for lack of a better term, sir? Given the runway that we have right now, being as short as it is, uh, and with many stores in Toronto, over 100, only got the vaccine to start administering uh, yesterday afternoon. Some are still waiting here right now. Uh, As we talk, uh, there are stores that haven't received any uh, extra doses uh, that are being reallocated for this effort. What that means is they've got three and a half days now to get through a lot of uh, vaccine, and that increases the prospect unfortunately, that um, there may be some some waste. Um, And this is a byproduct of pausing it two weeks ago, sitting in the fridges for almost two weeks uh, before we can now reallocate it and get it into arms for those uh, that are fortunate enough to get an early second dose. So it's putting pharmacists in a precarious position because we're going to do everything we can to make sure that that scenario doesn't happen. You know, we'll extend hours, we will move mountains in order to accommodate people and uh, meet that uh, shared objective of no wastage. But, you know, time is ticking away and there's only so much we can do in terms of being able to get that that done before the end of uh, Monday. Okay. I do wonder, though, uh, Justin Bates is with me, CEO, Ontario Pharmacists Association. Um, be careful what you wish for. I know pharmacists wanted to be part of the vaccination program. You've been on the program uh, before the vaccination program even started saying, you know, we want to be part of it. Um, we believe we have a role to play as neighborhood health care providers. We have experience administering flu shots. But now with all of the, you know, wait lists and calling people and uh, people calling back and scratching people off wait lists, putting people on wait lists, unreliable supply, all of this. I mean, uh, you know, uh, at the end of the day, a pharmacist has a business to run um, and it's well beyond giving out COVID-19 vaccines. There must be a thousand other things to do on a daily basis. For your local pharmacist, how much of the day is the COVID nineteen vaccination program consuming for our neighborhood pharmacists? Now, our average pharmacist in our neighborhoods, Justin Bates. Well, we're certainly still very much committed to and um, welcome the opportunity to be part of this. It's a public health crisis and and our members are stepping up and contributing significantly to not only mobilize quickly, but to provide greater access and convenience towards the vaccine. To your question around, you know, how, what kind of burden has this placed from an administrative perspective and, you know, just the, the overall, um, you know, attempt to try to operate a pharmacy in the midst of all this? Well, it, it, we're doing it. I mean, there's no question about that, and we can do it. We have the capacity and the resources. We have more um, people hired in order to meet the demand. Um, the challenge for us isn't so much that the task and then being involved in it. It's the fact that um, communications are not um, timely to our members. So they're often hearing about changes like they heard today through a press conference. So they don't have time to prepare. Um, and with the interruptions in supply, it's very difficult for them because they don't have answers for their patients. Um, when they come in and they hear uh, last Friday that they can get an early second dose, 
and yet uh, many didn't get any supply until Thursday, that puts them in a precarious position and they want to help. They want to make uh, it easy for their patients and uh, contribute to this, but you know, the information changing or not getting in their hands in a timely fashion, as well as not having supplies is what I think the frustration is. Okay. I thank you for your time and thank you to um, all the pharmacists out there as this uh, vaccination program rolls on, sir. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Justin Bates from the Ontario Pharmacists Association. Fans in the stands tomorrow for Hockey Night in Canada. We'll talk sports with Steve Warren. Coming right up, Rob Snow Show on City News. The food cupboard started about 25 years ago. Again, it was a very small operation in the basement of a church. Uh, and we have been expanding to the point where we needed to have a new facility. So in discussion with the, the city of uh, Ottawa and Jan Harder, the local uh, representative here, uh, we came to this location, which is about 2,000 square feet located in the Walter Baker Center. We've been here for about two years and it is much better. It gives us a much broader opportunity to serve our clients better. It's a fairly affluent community in Barhaven, so you wouldn't think that people would really need to have a food bank or a food cupboard. But people sometimes have a temporary loss of their job, uh, maybe new immigrants or refugees to the community. Maybe there's been an injury in the family or something like a pandemic that uh, causes uh, people to run short of food during their, their monthly requirements. So we uh, offer uh, any clients who come and live in our catchment area the opportunity to pick up an order of food every, every three, week, three or four weeks. The need varies from time to time. Uh, we have expanded our offering to include quite a few perishables, uh, eggs, milk, cheese, yogurt, vegetables, um, uh, fruit, uh, but people, people I think know that we need cans of beans and stuff as well too. One thing that we're, we're consistently short of sometimes is uh, personal hygiene products. You go to the grocery store, you buy your toothpaste and you buy your deodorant and shampoo there. Uh, people don't automatically think that to, to donate those kinds of things to a food cupboard. So we end up buying quite a few of those things from time to time. The pandemic has, has affected us like it has everybody. Initially, we had to stop the grocery store uh, food donations uh, so that we didn't have any risk of contamination and, and to, to have a significant number of volunteer work to be done in our facility. We have a, a storefront, so it's like a mini grocery store where you take a cart and you go around and pick out the things that you want. That doesn't work during the pandemic to maintain social distancing and so on. So what we have now is our clients can come in one at a time, they make an appointment, they stand behind a line and they direct our volunteer to, you know, I'd like Kellogg's Corn Flakes rather than Harvest Crunch. Uh, to pick the, the food that they would like off the shelves according to the allocation depending on the size of their family. And then they take it out, uh, load it into their vehicle or whatever, bring back the cart, we disinfect everything and prepare for the next client. We are very blessed here in Barhaven. Uh, we're a totally volunteer organization. So if you give a, a dollar to us, it goes to purchasing food or to provide some service to our clients. He's a pillar of community opinion. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. In sports, fans in the stands. That's going to be exciting. Uh, the Montreal Canadiens force game six with an overtime win last night in Toronto. Roll take. Cycles it to the near side. Bogosian moves up. Leaf play by the fence, but broken up. Cole Caulfield in load here. Along with Suzuki and off the pin. Nick Suzuki. It's in. Okay, uh, Chris Cuthbert with the call. It's so different. NHL playoff hockey without the fans in the stands. Uh, I bet you 2,500 people in the stands at Bell Center tomorrow night. It, it'll still be wild and crazy. 
Uh, let's talk about the last few days in sports and what could be ahead for this weekend with Steve Warren from the Sens Nation podcast and the Steve Warren Project. Welcome back. Thank you, Rob. How are things? Ah, everything. Everything's good, Steve. Um, I'll be. I'll be honest with you. I didn't think the Habs would make it this far. What about you? I was. I was certain they were dead last night. I mean, it was nice that we had a fun hockey game because it's been a terrible series, really disappointing entertainment-wise. But that was a fun hockey game last night, and to see them grab the three nothing lead and then fritter it away. I was absolutely certain when Toronto got it to 3-3 that that was the end of the season for the Canadians. They're right shooting the Habs. The Leafs had all the momentum. They even almost scored with about 10 seconds left. I was absolutely certain yeah. Montreal was done. Uh, and then Alex Galchenyuk makes a bonehead play. And, well, here we are. Game six go. coming up. Yeah. And those two youngsters for the for the Canadians, you know, even if you if they don't end up winning the series, you gotta gotta feel pretty good. Now Suzuki, I know a little bit about because I remember him from the World Junior Hockey Championships. Caulfield, Caulfield, right? I don't I don't know much about him. What's his story, Steve? He's the reigning Hobie Baker winner, and he is uh, just a the classic water bug forward. Uh, so much skill. He's a guy that's going to be elite for them on the power play. He's going to be a guy you know, you'll want to use every time in the shootout and came in late in the season. I was really shocked when Montreal didn't have him in the lineup early on in the series because I mean, scoring is going to be a problem for this team. Uh, they are the lowest ranked team in these playoffs, and there's a reason for that because they just don't have the high octane offense, and Caulfield could deliver some of that. And For them to not have him in the lineup in the early part of the series, I was shocked by, mm. and uh, I don't think he's coming out anytime soon. Yeah. I. They might force a game seven. I still don't give them much of a shot. I. Uh, what about you? I, I the Habs. I don't give them much of a shot. Still. No. No. Nor do I. I still think Toronto will win the series. Um, I mean, if the lowest ranked team in the playoffs though is giving them this much trouble, I don't see them ready to break their Stanley Cup drought. But they're still clearly the better team, and they should have won that game last night. Um, so yeah, I absolutely agree with you. Um, on paper. From what I've seen in the series so far, most all the prognosticators going into that game last night uh, didn't afford for any chance of Montreal winning that game. So I think um, cream tends to rise. So I really do think that uh, Toronto finishes this off. And I know there'll be some Hab fans who will say, well, we've got the home fans. We've got actual bodies in the stands. Yep, yep. But I will say this, Rob, I think the Leafs might be as energized as the Canadians to be playing in front of human beings once oh, yeah. again. yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. Play spoiler. Ruin it for them right in front of their fans just to rub it in, right? I, it's funny. Uh, I'm on, um, and I, I don't know if you've checked this out. I'm on StubHub right now. This is the hottest ticket in the country right now, Steve. Uh, StubHub says price per ticket right now. The cheapest one is 1600 and the most expensive ticket's 3700 a seat for tomorrow night. Hockey Night in Canada, Leafs, Habs. Yeah, I even read yeah. Ticketmaster's got someone in there looking for $8,000 for a single 100-level <laughs> seat. I mean, yeah, it gets to a stage where, I mean, how much do you want to see this hockey game? It's If you're a Hab fan, absolutely you want to be there. Not just for the game, it's the playoffs. You want to see your team and everything. But it, it almost feels like there's a little bit of history. Oh, yeah. that we're climbing out of this COVID abyss. Yeah, you want And you want to be part of this whole thing. I get that. But I think if I talk to... You know, 99.9% of Montreal Canadiens fans, and I say, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, $3,700 on StubHub or eight grand on Ticketmaster, hey, would you like $8,000 to not go to the game tonight? I think most people would say, <laughs> right. absolutely. For sure. <laughs> um, yeah, but honestly, it, it, I was expecting a lot of buzz um, and huge ratings. I even did a commentary about it. I mean, it's um, it really just hasn't lived up to the building. And maybe that's just because, you know, Quebec was under the curfew. Um, it's not like people can go out and party it up. Toronto's been under lockdown since Boxing Day, so it's not like anything's happening there. You don't see a lot of um, flags on vehicles or anything. So um, it's kind of been a, uh, a letdown, really. You know, and the hockey hasn't been great, especially from the Habs. So, yeah, I mean, I mean, guys our age, like we remember back in the day when, you know, Habs and and Leafs. I mean, that was such a huge component on Saturday night. This should have had all the elements 
of a fantastic series. We haven't seen it in, in over 40 years. Yeah. And it makes me wonder if maybe the no fan thing had a hand in it. Because I watch, in this first round of the playoffs, Rob, uh, this has been my primary series. I've been watching this one most closely. Okay. But I've been watching others as well in American sites, you know, like a Carolina, you know, the storm surge. They get 15,000 people in their building. Wow. And th- that adds to the entertainment value as a TV viewer as I'm watching it. There's really no replacement, no matter how good your sound technicians are with their fake sound effects and such. Natural fan sounds, the natural ebb and flow and the almost tangible excitement level that they provide while you're watching a game, that may have had a hand in why I think we here in Canada have found this yes. series kind of dull. Yeah, absolutely. Um, any any sense news of note this week, Steve? Well, the one I was disappointed by was seeing Vitaly Abramov basically head for the KHL signing a two-year contract. Um, I know it's a scenario where you can't develop everyone. If you're Ottawa, you've brought in all these assets and prospects and picks and the reality is there are only 12 forward spots 6d two goalies but it's still kind of i mean this is a season where you've had abramov philip schlapik rudolph's bouncers they've all just wandered away from the organization and they got nothing in return you know they schlapik was just allowed to leave bouncers claimed off waivers abramov signs in the khl it's um you know i i don't want to point fingers or anything like that but in terms of the asset management it would be nice to see them get something for these players if they right. decided, okay, they're not part of the equation. Abramov's a guy who had nearly a point a game in Belleville. He's only 23, and, um, you know, I, he's super small, granted, but I think you can play in the NHL if you're small. You, you, um, you'd, better be, uh, you'd better be elusive out there and fast, and, and Abramov is that. i just like to see a scenario where you're getting something for these guys. So that would be the Sens news of the week that, uh, that grabbed me. Okay. Enjoy the weekend in sports. Thank you, Rob. Yep. Thanks, Steve. Steve Warren from the Steve Warren Project and the Sens Nation Podcast. We're back with Queen's Park Week in Review right after the news on City News. news in Ottawa and the Valley. This is City News, now on 1011 FM and 1310 AM. It's Friday, the 28th of May. Good morning. I'm Sarah Buck, and right now in Ottawa and in Smith Falls, we've got nice bright sunshine, but 7 degrees. Here's what's making news this hour. We're now in a position to accelerate second doses in Ontario. 
That's Premier Doug Ford unveiling the anticipated move to shorten the interval between first and second doses of COVID-19 vaccine. Starting Monday, second doses will be offered to people over the age of 80, followed by anyone over the age of 70, starting the week of June 14th. Ford, as heard live here on City News, says the most vulnerable in Ontario will be protected first. And once they've had their second dose, the rest will receive second doses. That's based on when you got your first shot. That will depend on availability of vaccine and appointments with a goal of shrinking the interval to four weeks between doses. As for the reopening of schools, the premier says he's going to be super cautious, adding a couple of extra days and seeking a consensus on the safety of returning students to in-person learning is well worth it. Provincial health officials report 101 new cases of COVID-19 in Ottawa out of 1,273 new infections across Ontario and 14 more deaths in Ontario due to the virus. Elsewhere locally, Leeds Grenville Lanark Health Unit confirms two new cases of COVID-19. The province is reporting 13 new cases in eastern Ontario and two new infections in Renfrew County. Local health units update their numbers in the afternoon. I'm Sarah Buchan for News Anytime. Follow up online at ottawa.citynews.ca. He's the opinionated Ottawa icon. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. All right, a lot of ground to cover today. A lot of breaking news to go around. And it's time for Queen's Park Week in Review. We look back at some of the big issues confronting the Ontario government and everything kind of flows, of course, from our fight against COVID-19. So, uh, John Fraser is here, Liberal uh, MPP, Ottawa South. John, welcome back. Hey, John, Rob, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Uh, a, f- a new name for our panel today. Parm Gill is the Progressive Conservative MPP. The writing is Milton. Is that right, Mr. Gill? That is absolutely right. Yes. Very nice to hear from you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. And uh, it would normally, normally, uh, Gilles Bisson is here from from the New Democrat from Timmins. But from time to time, we do have the great John Vantoff, who joins us. Uh, He's the NDP MPP, I believe it's Tamiskaming Cochrane, if I'm not mistaken, right? Uh, Yeah. And where are you today, sir? I am at my home in Cobalt. In Cobalt, Ontario, soon to be the boom town that's going (laughs) to... And fuel the green economy for us. That's right. Like beautiful Cobalt, Ontario. I'd be curious to know the price of gas in Cobalt, Ontario. You bet I would. One thirty-six for regular. One thirty-six. Woo. One thirty-six. Dollar uh, thirty around the corner here from the radio station. What are you paying in Milton for gas these days, Mister Gill? What do you? What? Are, what's it, gas going for? It's 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 not a whole lot different. We're hovering uh, around hundred. Uh, I mean, uh, buck twenty-seven, buck twenty-eight. Buck twenty-seven. <laughs> Screaming deal at a buck twenty seven. I take not that. a whole lot different. Yeah. Nine cents. <laughs> Nine cents a liter. Nine cents a liter. Have you seen John Vantoff's truck? He's got a big truck. Uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, John. I do. John. What do you? What did you? What was your last fill up, John? Uh, Mine. Uh, dollar. Dollar twenty two. Dollar twenty two. Where are you getting here. gas, John? It's not too far from the station. It's just the Ultramar on the corner of Heron and Walkley. Ultramar. You know where that is? Oh, yeah, I know where that is. Yeah. Oh, here in a well, walk. I just, yeah, I, okay. I, I, I go late at night. Late at night? Like around 9 or 10 o'clock, <laughs> okay. you know, as, as it does. Are you, you're one of those gas shoppers, John. You're one of, well, one of those I people. Just, I, I just figure it's close and, you know, usually yeah. I check it out about 10 o'clock at night. Okay. Day, so. <laughs> well, I know along Maryville Road, some, uh, like around, there's a Canadian Tire gas bar there, and sometimes you can get a good deal there. And um, near Maryville Meadowlands area, there's a... You can get good gas, good gas prices the, there. The, but the no. best time to find deals is always the end of the day with the gas. That's what I find. So okay. I always try to fill up the, towards the end of yeah. the day if I can. Yeah, and fight against Mr. Trudeau's carbon tax. That's a good way to do it too, I think. But uh, <laughs> nevertheless, that's not what we're here to talk about. And we've, I've, I've squandered far too much time. Um, look, we heard, we carried it live here on the Rob Snow Show on City News, the Premier's News Conference. Uh, he was asked about a, a great many things, and he spent a great deal of time uh, going after the Trudeau government. And we're gonna we have some highlights that we've spliced together here uh, uh, on two things again: supply of vaccines and the border, the border, the border, the border. This is Premier Ford. So as we speed up our rollout, we need the federal government to heed our call. 
We need them to fix the problems at the borders. Those are staggering, staggering numbers. And I mentioned this to the Prime Minister. It was like, uh, as far as he was concerned, there, there didn't seem like there was a problem. And I'm really concerned about the variants. Uh, we weren't dealing with uh, the, the deadly Indian variant uh, a few months ago. We're dealing with it now. The federal expert panel came back and, and said, uh, you know, the, the, there is basically no plan for the federal borders. No plan for the federal borders. I mean, he kept hammering away on that during his news conference today. It was a big talking point for the premier today. Uh, before we get to, to, to Parm Gill, uh, let's start with the NDP. It's the official opposition in the legislature. What do you, what do you think about that, Mr. Bantock? The um, border. The border. Yeah, first of all, uh, the border is an issue. That there's no, there's no denying that the border is one issue in the fight of COVID. But it's only one. And there are many issues equally as big or bigger, uh, workplace transmission, other things that we fail to do as a province, that it seems that the Premier wants to deflect from those issues and focus on the one that he doesn't control while he's not okay. focusing on the on the things that could make a bigger difference. What, what, like what? Control. Like, like what, John Vantoff? Well, so we've had to fight the, the uh, Conservative government for... Uh, the whole 14 months to actually have effective paid sick days so people who didn't have to go to work sick and we knew where the where the virus was spreading we knew telling people to stay home if they're sick and knowing that they can't because they need to pay their rent they need to feed their families and again that's something that was under the province's control they fought it for months and months and months saying the federal program was sufficient when we all knew it wasn't. There's a good example. All right. John Fraser, what do you think? Yeah. Borders. John just gave, John just gave a great example. All right. And, um, and look, here's the, other, here's the other thing, is that the science table told the Premier about variants of concern in February. It's not if, but when. So you need to be cautious opening up. Well, the Premier wasn't cautious. We opened up wide, and uh, we didn't take the public health measures that we needed to take at the time to ensure that we didn't end up in this lockdown. So look, definitely the border, it has to make more sense to people. I know that there's some more advice that I think came to the government yesterday. I didn't see all of it in terms of the border. Uh, but the thing is, the things that we need to do with public health measures, paid sick days, uh, they didn't happen. And we had to drag the government screening and kicking to ten paid, you know, to, to three paid sick days. And, uh, and, you know, when just literally everybody was telling them, you got to do this. So... Um, you know, the, the premier likes to say the buck stops here. Yeah. But the premier's always quick to assign blame, which is generally not a characteristic in someone where the buck stops. Okay, Parm Gill, uh, the buck passing, not buck stopping. What do you What do you think, Parm Gill, the premier? So I, 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 you know what I would say is I'm I'm glad that uh, both of my colleagues from the NDP and the Liberals, first of all, understand borders is serious and it's a big issue. It's something that our government has been calling on the federal government for months and months now. Um, you know, obviously we all know that the, the variants that we have in the province or in the country uh, didn't swim across the oceans. They got here uh, in flights. As a matter of fact, we are seeing continuously daily flights coming in with infected um, individuals flying into the country. And of course, you know, the, the federal ministers and the prime minister would like to say that only represent so one or two percent of the overall uh, spread. Uh, but the reality is, as far as I'm concerned, every single one of these uh, cases or the spread within uh, the province of the country has come from outside of our borders. And there are so many loopholes, especially when it comes to even land borders. So people are coming in, they're circumventing the quarantine rules, uh, they're going about their business, they are continuing to spread well, uh, the... Well, yeah, this advisory panel says quarantine. just get rid of the quarantine hotels. And that but now, just right? because so, there yeah. are so many loopholes, so just right. by putting the quarantine hotels by by the airport and still letting people mm -hmm. in come across the borders that don't have to uh, comply mm -hmm. with the same rules, we've been calling on the federal government to, to do better. Uh, you know, the reality is the Indian variant now in the province, we have over 300 cases of that already. As a matter of fact, just over the last couple of weeks, uh, that has gone up by in excess of 
600%. So think about it. We all know what's going on in India. Listen, I was born, I came immigrated to this country at a young age from India. I still got, you know, uh, family, friends, and I understand the challenges firsthand. And they even, uh, you know, I know that the liberal government prevented direct flights from, say, India and Pakistan. Majority of the people that fly into our country from both of those countries do not take direct flights. As a matter of fact, most are connecting flights. So whether they're connecting uh, through Heathrow, they're connecting through Dubai and some of the other countries, they're all yep. coming. And that is still allowed. That is still happening. Okay. Okay. That's what we they're, need. They're all right. Canadians. All right. All right. They're Canadians. So are you telling Canadians? They so have are you are you telling me all of them are Canadian? Absolutely and, and, not. And, and and you're and John, well, did you, did John, you you're wrong. You need travel? to check your Arm, facts, my Arm, friend. I'm telling Arm, you. Arm, you need to check the rules. And the other thing I want to mention to you is there are thousands and thousands of truckers that come across the 52nd parallel every this day. This does not include every the truckers. So the numbers that I'm yeah. giving you, John, 150,000 over two weeks, do not include essential workers, do not include truckers. I understand. This is excluding all of those. People literally flying into Buffalo, taking a taxi to the border, walking over. They're That's Canadians. the problem that we need to address. They're Canadians. Not all so you're of them telling are Canadians. Canadians. Are you, no, but if they're doing it, John, but if they're doing it, John, to circumvent uh, having to go into quarantine... If they're John, doing it you, to specifically look, I, to, know, I think I think it's quite easy for the you know the the provincial government uh, has policing forces. So people leaving the airport, they can run a check. They can run a check at the borders if they if if, if they're that concerned. And the reality is, these people are Canadians coming back. The people who, who were the the British ferry that spread last uh, Christmas was a couple from I think Oshawa, Durham. They were Canadians. They didn't come so, from somewhere else. So, so, they so were John, are you, are you saying the only people that are allowed to fly in or cross I'm the border that people, country I'm, right now are only Canadians? With, with, uh, there are specific exceptions that are very stringent. Well, so why does the so federal government fail to provide okay, okay, that okay. information? We're, we're, we're eating into our, a lot of our time. We're, we're kind of going around in circles here. Uh, another point, I mentioned the border. Another point that the premier raised time and time and time again, and I'm going back to John Vantoff here. And then we'll let Parm and John Fraser yell at each other. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the premier likened uh, the the reliability of the supply of vaccines. He, he likened it to uh, a, an auto assembly line. I imagine trying to build a car without knowing if you'll have a reliable supply of parts. For example, that was the uh, the comparison that he used. Uh, and he said, you know, his frustrations are shared by all the premiers. How, how fair is that, um, the, the, uh, John Vantoff? Yeah, I'm... I'm the supply uh, has been unreliable from the federal I am not government. an auto assembly guy. I'm a farmer, and we get prepared for the seasons when we know they're coming, and we can't prepare for everything. So you need to be prepared for all eventualities. You need to be prepared for as much vaccine as you can possibly get. And if you don't get as much as you can get, you also need yeah. to be able to distribute that. So what, what, what would happen, though, if you couldn't get any seed? Well, if you couldn't get any seed, you're, you are in a big problem. But it's not so. that we're not getting any seed. There's as much problem with the distribution as there is with, with, uh, with and the information as there is with the, with the vaccine. So just this morning, the Premier tweeted out that he's okay for his second shot of AstraZeneca, but not according to the rules. So the Premier himself... <laughs> The premier himself is confusing people. I got my shot the day after the premier, and I know I'm not. I don't qualify for weeks. So <laughs> it, it's as much an, a, uh, an information problem from the government as it is. There is a lack of vaccine. We'd be great if we all had our second shots available. But you need to do the best with what you have, and they have done a poor job at informing people and distributing what they do have. Okay, uh, John Fraser. Supply. Supply. You, Supply. You a, yeah, you need a plan. Yeah, you need a plan. You need a plan that deals with the. So, who's whose plan what faltered plan? here? Was it Mr. Trudeau's plan or Mr. Ford's plan? No, Mr. Ford's plan is to distribute the vaccines that he gets. So you have to be prepared to have a. You have to have a plan so that you can adapt that plan if you get fewer or you get more. And clearly, there's been very poor communications about the vaccine rollout. You know, I, I know I've said this a million times, but, you know, when the vaccines first rolled out, we took a vacation over Christmas and doing vaccines while other provinces are doing vaccines. And it took us half a million doses.
to get to the 70,000 people that we needed to get to first in long-term care. So I, I think the Prieger could have had a much more solid plan uh, for vaccinating people and uh, for making it easier, like right now for over 80 year olds, they said, you can get your second dose earlier, maybe, and you'll have to do it on your own. That's literally what they said this morning. I, I'm, I'm excited, I think it's great that we're gonna go to second doses. But literally they said, you're gonna have to figure it out for yourself and you might not get a sooner, uh, an appointment sooner. <laughs> what? Okay. It's like the Hunger Games 2.0. Hunger Games 2.0. Okay, uh, there you go. It's it's the <laughs> Hunger Games out there, Parm Gill. Okay. So you know, I, I mean, I understand. Uh, obviously, you know, both of my my, my friends. Uh, like, the, is the Premier the Donald Democrats. Sutherland in this whole play here? What's going? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and I understand they would have a hard time giving Premier credit or a government in terms of how successful the rollout the vaccine program has been. The reality is, we vaccinated uh, with the, with at least one dose, 8.6 million Ontarians, and 624,000 have been fully fully vaccinated. Um, you know, in terms of the supply of vaccine, we clearly know that, you know, the federal government dropped the ball on that right from the get-go. There are other countries that were far, far ahead of us, and finally we're getting some supply. And our teams and our government, I think, has done a tremendous, tremendous job in the frontline healthcare workers vaccinating individuals. And we are now leading the way with some, you know, the supply that finally we did get. Uh, but the reality is also that, we continue to see, um, you know, uh, when it comes to Moderna, when it comes to AstraZeneca, in terms of uh, the supply and the, the dates that are promised and then ultimately not, uh, you know, the, the provinces and receiving those uh, target dates. So us having to work around that, that's what the previous frustration was at the press conference that he alluded to, you know, comparing the car parts. If you don't have the product, how are you supposed to assemble something? How are you supposed to put that out on the shelf for people to be able to use it? And that's the frustration that we do have. But at the same time, you know, we know Pfizer has been fairly regular uh, in terms of uh, providing uh, the vaccine and that we and obviously our uh, the government and the, all of the experts and the teams that are out there that are putting uh, these vaccines into people have done a tremendous, tremendous job uh, hitting, you know, 65 percent of 18 plus adults okay. in the province. And I think that's something that we Gotta can stop. all be proud of. Got to stop here. We'll be back. Part two, Queen's Park Week in review right after this on the Rob Snow Show on City News. We just took over this business about a few weeks prior to the pandemic, but we've been loving the community, the people, very friendly. Um, but it's been very difficult starting up a new business, just the time that we did, but I'm sure it's the same everywhere. We did take a broken business, which doesn't help us, but uh, we thought we just, we believe in what we do. We're very passionate about food, and we just really wanted to share the Iraqi culture through our food. All our recipes are homemade, so this is very unique. Usually you hear restaurants, shops, it's all frozen food or prepared food. So nothing here is prepared, everything is homemade. We get our meat and produce from a local farm. So supporting local is the way to go. We are supporting all the way um, and our meat are actually marinated the day of so it's as fresh as can be quality ingredients and everything is made from scratch I get a lot of people when they come in they say it tastes like Middle Eastern like back home so for you to have been to Iraq and have the food there you can really like compare and see the similarity. We do like to focus on healthy. So our recipes, not only the homemade, again, everything is from scratch, but we have like from combos and to, to like small sandwiches. Our, our, one of our favorites and a lot very popular is the chicken salad and the beef salad. So now you're getting all the protein and all these amazing ingredients that we all need. During this time, I find a lot of people are sitting at home. 
and not enough movement. So to come here and get something healthy, healthy other than go elsewhere and just put, you know, what's not so good for our bodies makes a huge difference. So we have shawarma sandwiches, combos. I mean, if you're looking for a meal to feed your family, I would highly recommend a family platter. It comes literally with everything, with potatoes, um, with rice, with chicken, with beef. Um, and we don't charge extra for mix. I know a lot of places do. Here, we just add everything to our platter. And lots of healthy choices, for sure. We're very passionate about food. And for our small family business, it's, it's been good. Like I said, it's a little struggle. Um, but we are not a chained restaurant. Strong voice. Strong opinions. The Rob Snow Show returns on Rogers TV and City News. 1011 FM and 1310 AM. We're back. Uh, we don't have a lot of time. Five, six minutes for Queen's Park Week in Review. John Fraser, John Vantoff, and uh, Parm Gill. Uh, John Fraser, Liberal. John Vantoff, New Democrat. Parm Gill, Progressive Conservative. Uh, Premier Ford promising during his news conference a two-dose summer that everyone 12 plus should be able to be vaccinated by the end of August. But on schools, really no news. He was asked today uh, if Dr. Williams says it's okay to reopen schools, are you afraid to make decisions? This is what the Premier said on schools today. Uh, I know very clearly where Dr. Williams stands, but I want the scientists to weigh in. I want to make sure the, the teachers unions weigh in. I want the uh, other educational uh, workers to weigh in. I, I just, you know, I don't want to rush this. If it takes a couple extra days, so be it. This is a massive decision. This is a decision that's going to affect every single person in Ontario. We know that 25% of families have at least one child in, in uh, yeah, that's everywhere. Good. That's from good, Dad. Thank you. Uh, John Fantoff, really n nothing there. Uh, if it takes a couple of days, it takes a couple of days. He's looking for consensus. What do you think, John Fantoff? Um, yeah, it's amazing that the Premier has waited this long to consult the people who know a lot about education. We... The consensus is, is an issue. It's the Premier's job to make tough decisions. Our problem with the Premier during this whole process is he's been unwilling to say or show where on whose advice he's basing these decisions on. So a few days ago, it was about his four golf buddies who went for a couple pops after. And so no one's denying the fact that the Premier and the government need to make tough decisions. But we all need to know what they're basing these decisions on. And to say that now you need consensus is basically saying, okay, now I don't want to make the decision unless everyone agrees. And I think anyone, anyone who has ever been involved in any big decision, you need the best information possible. You need to know where it's coming from. But you're not going to be able to get everyone to agree. Sure. Okay, John Fraser. What do you think about that? He wants. Yeah. A, no, I just. Okay. I just think it's just a sign that again, you know, John mentioned this earlier in the program about having a plan. Uh, we knew we were going to have to open. You know, we we're going to open schools at some point, uh, and we knew that the responsibility would be open in June. So you'd think there had been more of a plan. Finger literally said the week before, "I don't know what to do," and then Thursday, the week later, he sends out a letter that's asking for consensus, but reads more like an ultimatum. Like, I need it by 5 o'clock Friday. And I think uh, two things here is that there's not been a plan, that they're not ready, and that uh, mm -hmm. I think that the Premier wants to build consensus. It might uh, be an important thing to have continual dialogue with people on important issues such as education. And that's what I think is missing here. Uh, you know, it's just, it's just hard for me to believe that he would send out an open letter, forget the CC school boards, and say, you know, uh, the deadline's 5 o'clock Friday afternoon. Like, really? Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, Parm Gill, what's taking so long? Uh, well, thank you, Rob. I mean, uh, the reality is no one wants to see our schools reopen more than we do, our government. And listen, I mean, I, I'm a proud father of three, two of them are in the school system, so I understand uh, the challenges firsthand. At the same time, you know, the reality is uh, the recent modeling presented by the science table suggested that 
should Ontario reopen schools uh, to in-class learning, we could see an increase of 6 to 11 percent in number of daily new cases. That is a big number. You know, the premier is doing the right thing. The government is doing the right thing by trying to get everybody some sort of a consensus by consulting, by taking advice from the medical, public health and also education experts. So we're all hopefully can collectively come to a, some sort of an agreement, including, of course, you know, the teachers and the, and the unions that are also opposed to the idea. The, the top priority for our government, I think for any government, should be, of course, the health and safety of the people that they represent. And that it is basically what our government is trying to do. We want to open school. We want to open everything as right. quickly as we can. Okay. But at the same time, your responsibility to do it. Yeah, but I guess the, the, you know, the question is, through all of this, for almost the last year and a half, Mr. Gill, with all due respect, the Premier has always said, if, it, if, if, if Premier Williams says it's okay, I rely on the advice of Premier Williams. Premier Williams says it's okay to... Uh, Premier Williams. See, there I go. <laughs> Dr. Williams. Dr. <laughs> Williams. <laughs> and sometimes it seems like it's a Premier Williams. But, um, but now, all of a sudden, it's about consensus building. I don't get it. A lot of people are confused by this. Uh, you know, just because there are, uh, you know, different opinions and depending on who you talk to and the experts and the main one being, as I mentioned, is the, the, the modeling presented by the science table. That This program is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit Rogers.com for more details.